If you want to build a setting team or an outbound sales team for your business, this video is going to be for you. Recently, I spoke at Sam Evans Quantum Mastermind and got up there for a couple of hours and when a group of 80 people just fielded all of the questions they had about outbound settings, setting processes, setting scripts, hiring, firing, training, everything. So we'll splice over to the video now. Enjoy. So this piece of paper says we should do YouTube ads next. However, I don't know about you, I'm kind of tired of YouTube. <laughs> Maybe we should just switch it with setters and outbound to have a change of topic. Yes. And then we can always come back to some more traffic stuff. What do you reckon? Yes. Okay. All right. Well, Cole Gordon is the man for setters and outbound and sales team. Um, can you guys get him mic'd up? Let's just get all your questions on the board, and then we'll kind of see what the themes are. Sorry. No? Oh, same thing. We can just get all your questions on the board, and then based on kind of the themes, we can like break it up into certain certain parts. But yeah, I don't have like a presentation or whatever, so it's just whatever you guys want to learn. Commission structure for right. centers and closers. All right, so you're going first. Right. So comms. A cadence of meetings. How often or how many? Okay. At what point do you need it? Gotcha. What is a realistic timeline to like get your sales team to already be up and running without you? So ramp time. Yeah. And and that's from like zero. If you're from zero. Sales. From zero for me personally. Hello, 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 hello. Can you hear me? So hiring a salesman, that's actually a really good one. That's hard, it's quite, people have a lot of challenges with that. What are the biggest pitfalls when it comes to hiring salesmen? Oh, okay. Setter, pitfall. So basically setter script. No, but this helps them give us everything. So we have to figure out what everything is. Yeah. What else? Is there any strategies to get more capable? More oh pips. Yeah, there is. That's I, I got a really good one for that. Oh, okay. Oh, so like you want to uh, hire the one person who could hire the ten. And then work with that manager. Yes. So I call that hiring a sales integrator. You got systems of hiring, right? He's got tech. Okay. Sorry. Tech slash systems, same thing, right? Well, yeah, it depends how you define systems. Mindset how to go when, when you're one closer can collect up to fifty k and then how to make his mindset that he can collect way more because I have heard people collect like five hundred per person. Yeah, well, I would say that kind of depends on the offer, right? Like, I the most I've ever seen is a closer do eight hundred grand cash in a month, but 
lot of that was like the offer and the leads and the price. And so, you know, that can depend. But we could talk about sales mindset, but that kind of goes back to the consistency thing, right? For what, setters? For setters. That's the best way. OK, so we'll do the setter funnels. Yeah. And also how you look at like marketing and sales together. Oh, like, that's good. How do you fill the calendars consistently as well? Yeah. What about closes and, and then account management contentions? Like at what point do you split that into different people? What was that, sorry? So you got your closers and then like Dre and Hauser, like they then manage the retention. At what point would you split that into just closing and just okay. customer success? So I'll call that uh, Yeah, so I mean, so I, I don't do it that way. What I do is you have, you have essentially three sales uh, people in your organization. You have your setters, which takes uh, basically no interest and converts it into interest. Yeah. You have your closers who takes the interest and converts it into a client. Then you have your client success manager who takes a client and retains the client or upsells the client, right? So like, you can almost think of your client success managers as your setters for your dedicated back-end salesperson. So I mean, we could talk about, I mean, if you want to talk about. Would you split it? Yeah, I mean, yeah, I, would, I wouldn't have, I mean, it, it, in general, shouldn't really have your salespeople doing fulfillment. The only objective they should have is new business development. Right. Right? Because it's, it's, it's sales is one of those things that's not finite, right? Like you could, there, there's, like with a lot of positions in any company, there's a set amount of things you could do before you, you've completed your tasks. But with setting and closing, I mean, they can make it infinite amount of dials. They can take it, you know, it, it, it's really as much time as they put into it. So that's why I don't like giving them anything else except for selling. Besides their 5% of their time, 10% of their time should be admin, which is updating the CRM, stuff like that. So you want all their focus dedicated on that. If you read uh, Sales Management Simplified by Mike, Mark uh, Weinberg, it's a pretty good book on sales management. That is one of his big, like, big key ideas is, is really focusing their time just on new business. Well, I think many people would like to share your offer structure for your service or the course. Mm-hmm, okay. That would be really all valuable. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Sure. Okay, yeah, well, that's kind of here. Okay. All right. Did we get it all, for the most part? I'm sure we'll have more. Okay, so I'll, I'll just to make it more interactive, just remember which one was your question, and then I'll call on you, and that way we can make sure, you know, we have like a discussion about it. So commissions, that's pretty easy, but who asked that? Thanks. Okay, great. So the, the big thing with commissions is you want to think about it not as the percentages, but as the on-track earnings, okay? So in, in general, a setter is going to be, you want them to get about four grand a month to, I would say at most nine grand a month, but typically I say four to eight grand a month. What you want to do is, okay, that's like the, the earnings range you want to be able to provide for them. And then you back out utilizing your lead flow, your compensation structure, and what the conversion rates are gonna be, you back out the uh, commission structure that's gonna get them into that range. So like for instance, for my B2B company, it's a flat 3% no base. For my B2C company, it's $1,500 a month plus 5% commission. So it's very different. And, and actually, the B2B people still make more with even that lower, because the price points are different, the, uh, the conversion rates are different. It's just a lot of this stuff is different. You so get a different quality of person if they have a base versus don't have a base. Uh, generally, no. In generally, I would say no. Yeah. What's really important is that you can demonstrate for your salesperson that somebody else is doing this position successfully, right? And if you're if you're hiring a setter for the first time, what's a really great strategy? Because you might be trying to figure it out a little bit, right? And it's like. It's not validated. Whereas if it's a closer, if you're doing all the sales calls and you're closing 35%, you could say, hey, dude, well, even if you just close 28%, you're going to make this. And the leads are already there. The calls are already there. The scripts are already there. Here's my call recordings. So they have a strong baseline. But if it's a setter and nobody's ever done it before, 
they're, they're kind of walking into an unvalidated system, so to speak. So to get around that, what I recommend, this is what I did when I built my first setter team, is you hire two and then you give them a draw that's 60 days. So they make a minimum of like 4K or 4,500 a month. And then if their commissions exceed the 4K to 4,500 a month, they just make whatever their commissions are. And then that way you have kind of 60, 60 uh, days to sort of like figure it out with them. And you can even say, hey, we're like kind of testing some new ads. So like, we're gonna give you this runway to work with. Because what, what happens is, let's say like you, you launch a funnel and then they're doing stuff and the leads are really, really bad. If they're 100% commission, they're gonna panic. And then you're gonna, you know, you're gonna churn them out after two weeks and then, and you, and you don't really have that example of like, here's somebody who's doing really well, right? So, so typically though, so with setters, I gave you the range. Generally, almost all of my clients do 1500 a month plus 3%. three That's like the main one. But I would really recommend you look at the range and then back out something to get in those earnings. Because sometimes, like if you're a, if you're an offer that's twenty eight hundred bucks, three percent's not going to work, right? So like you gotta just keep that in mind. No, but they do have to make dials to not get fired. So what are those metrics like? How many dials do they have to make? How many appointments have to? So I don't. Well, let, let, that's that's KPI. So let's do let's do comps. So uh, with closers, typically the on-track earnings is I would say about eight to 15 grand, a, I know this is a wide range, but eight to 14, 15 grand a month if it's a B2C offer. And then for B2B, especially if you're in like, if you're, if you're in like MySpace, coaching, consulting, stuff like that to where they're like, you know, even selling people like you guys to where they're gonna see all these other commission structures, that you wanna get to about 15 to 25, hopefully, if they're, if they're doing really, really well. Right? I found after 25, you know, if you, get, if you get a guy above 20 or a girl above 20, they're gonna stick with you for a while. And I find after that, there's very diminishing returns. Like, you know, they're not any happier at 30, 35 or 40 than they were at 21. Typical closers is 10. 10. Right, but still same things. You, you kind of want to back out what's gonna hit that on-track earnings. Almost always with closers, it, it's around 10. And, and the way it works out with that, why I give you different ranges for the B2C versus B2B, is with B2C, with the price point at 10%, they're gonna be at a little bit lower pay range, whereas B2B, when you're at 7,500 to kind of 12K-ish range plus, that's how they can get those higher, higher earnings. Cole, can you clarify the percentage? Is it the cost of the business or is it the one that- like, It's on cash collected. But is it the cost of business at three percent? Because, for example, if I pay you ten percent of what you bring to the company, I have to pay an additional eight percent on top of what I pay you in tax, because the company pays the tax. Oh no! Well, yeah, we're not factoring in tax, right? But like, obviously, this is expense of your company, so it's it's a write-off. Sorry. Percentage. So again, you know, six to ten k is the target, the range I want to go for and back out of. Generally, a lot of my clients do 1500 a month plus like 3%. Sometimes if the price point's lower, they'll do a little bit more. And then if it's new, you just add a draw for the first 60 days. If it's like the first time you've ever hired a setter. So you get a percentage of what the closer does? Yeah. So no, they don't get the, it's not, the percentage is not out of, it's just the percentage of cash collected. Yeah, it's not out of like the closer's yeah. commission. Yeah. Based on what they generate. And then CSMs typically, um, you know, I, I have two, two companies, so I have two different CSMs. One is I, I pay 6.5% of the deal. I, I usually don't recommend ever doing that. I can, that, that one's different. The, the main one we do is it's about uh, six grand a month is their base, and they have some bonuses to get them up to like eight to 10 grand a month. But usually with a CSM, if they're around there, they're gonna be doing good. So that's commissions. Anybody else on commissions? Sorry, did you send those CSM numbers? Typically, the range is like, I would say seven to ten grand a month. What comps. Selling, what do you give them so, so with ours, our with our B two B, I pay an extraordinary amount to my fulfillment people because they have to be really good salespeople to fulfill on the product, because they're training our clients, sales teams a lot of the times, and they have to know how to, you know, like they have to get sales teams, all that stuff. Well, with good salespeople. You know the really really good ones are you know usually making fifteen to twenty five thousand a month, like I said. So I had to kind of create a structure that at least equaled that. 
And so the archetype I go for with my CSMs for our B2B is the burned out salesperson who wants to make recurring commissions opposed to starting every month from zero, right? So then, then what they do is they get 6.5% from the client or from cash collected on the client. So that's incentivizing them to get the client to pay. And then we upsell them to the mastermind and they get 16.5% on that. Yeah, so I mean, I got a guy making like 45 grand a month. You know, I mean, he's doing really, really well, but he has also, CSM. yeah. Wow. But I mean, he's also, like if he was a salesperson, he could make 30 grand a month. Like he's really good. You know, he's very, very, very good. But like when I, I mean, I do pay them a lot, but at our event, people will come up to me all the time and they always compliment how good that person is. Like, oh, this person's amazing, stuff like that, so. You mentioned, did you say 16? 16 and a half, yeah, they get bank. Shit. Yeah, but, but you know, I got these like really high performing salespeople and they need to be good at sales, you know? So it's, I, I never recommend clients model what I did. I think it mine just a little bit of a unique situation. Our RCA CSMs, they just make like eight to 10K a month. Uh -huh. it's, it's 6K a month plus some bonuses. CSM. But you know, that, that's an easier position to put. So. <laughs> Yes, client success. No, they, they literally make 6K a month base, and then they get like a little commission for like every single client that gets hired. That's our success metric for our RCA program, is like how many hires can they get. So, Paul, you would not recommend my sales girl upselling into the next offer? It should be So you can. So for back ends, there's a couple different ways you can do it, right? So you could have your existing sales team also sell the back end. That is possible. That's what I did when I was at Traffic and Funnels. You can have uh, your account manager, who is the coach, they can upsell. Or my favorite way is to have some sort of dedicated back-end salesperson, and then the coach is like the setter for that person. Because in my company, all of our coaches are salespeople. So obviously, I'm gonna have, have them all do the sales. And, and they like that. But like, if, uh, like I had a client who was doing a couple million a month in a crypto offer. Right? Well, all their, their coaches were like super nerds. And so like they couldn't sell. So their, their CSMs made like 2% and they set for a dedicated back-end salesperson who upsold into the mastermind. And that dedicated back-end salesperson was first the founder. And then when that vol call volume got too high, they made it the sales manager. You know, so there's different ways you could do it. I typically recommend having a dedicated back-end salesperson. And usually that should be you to start until you're at like, I mean, if you're taking a call every day, I mean, I that would even be a lot. But if, you know, if you're taking like three calls a week, I think it's pretty easy for a founder to do that. When it starts to kind of stack up, you either want to take like your best CSM who has sales abilities or your sales manager and have them do it. Um, it, it you know, you're probably not going to be in a position where you got to hire a dedicated person just for it, right? Because there's just not enough call volume of upgrades. If I'm, say, doing some joint venture webinars and I'm generating strategy sessions that way, which has nothing to do with the setter, mm -hmm. how, do they then, how do I then calculate the commission that goes to the setter? Because you said it was on cash collected, but wouldn't we- Well, it's just on the deals that they set that close. Right, yeah. Do you have a piece of tech that does that? Like, I don't even know um, how to track that. Yeah, I mean, I'm like, I don't, yeah, I have a really good CFO who built all that stuff. And there's some sort of way that we know, but yeah, there, there's trackers and all this stuff. I have like some trainings on it I could probably send you. It's just, I don't know off the top of my head. Is it good on commissions? Yeah. Cool. So let's move on to the meeting cadence and uh, how to manage the sales team. So, you know, the biggest thing is like a, a couple of years ago, I was really trying to, really, really trying to communicate like the bare minimum our clients needed to do to be able to manage the sales team effectively. Because like what I had found in my company is that like, okay, so imagine, you know, you get, somebody gives you Infusionsoft, right? Well, if they just give you Infusionsoft, the chances of you utilizing that product to experience the benefits all by yourself effectively is very low, right? So they give you a CSM to help you realize the benefits of that product. So it's very, very similar of like with a salesperson. We give somebody a salesperson, but if they've never built a sales team before, you know, even if the salesperson is really good, I mean, the, the, sometimes the chances of them actually being able to run a sales team and utilize and like 
lead that salesperson is very, very low. You know, and if the, if the person's not a good leader, the salesperson leaves and it's all, all these things. So what I created is what's something called the big three. And it's these three things that we really always require all the clients to, to do who recruit for us, that recruit from us, that help their sales team run effectively, okay? And the first one, I'll, I'll, I'll go through it this way. The first one is proper tracking, right? And, and most of you guys, I think, here would have that. But, you know, we track basically scheduled calls, which is like you wake up each day, how many calls are on the calendar? Scheduled calls, live calls, which is the shows, offers, which is how many offers that are made, closes, and then front end cash collected, which is day one cash collected, and then total revenue, which is deal size times closes. So, you know, same way as with paid ads, like you can't understand what the constraint is in your paid ads if you're not tracking all the metrics down the funnel correctly. It's the same thing with your sales team, right? So you wanna have that first and foremost. The second thing is what's called an end of day report. So in Slack, there's a channel called end of day closers, and then we have another one, end of day setters. All the closers and setters are in there, and what they do each day is they submit a report, and it says end of day name and date, and then they basically say projected whatever they projected today, and then how many deals they actually hit. They set their projections every day in the morning. We can cover projections later if you want. And then after that, they list out all their consults and basically like what happened, like what worked or what didn't work, and what is the clear next step slash what was the result. So it'll be like prospect name, and then it would be like closed one, or prospect, uh, or it would be prospect name and then like to pay, or prospect name, pay in full, prospect name, follow up set, or DQ, right? So like they put the result, and then next to the result, they write a three to four sentence description of what happened on that call. And then so they do that for every call that they had that day. And then after that, they, um, they we, we have them do some ratings like, in terms of how they like how did they feel physically today were they inspired did they do the morning routine stuff like that but more importantly at the bottom they they do an overall and that's kind of a synopsis of how they felt about their entire day what worked what didn't work how they're like mentally feeling spiritually feeling physically feeling if they're you know if they're behind pace on their projections this week why are they behind pace what's the diagnosis of that all of that stuff so that end of day report is really really key because at the end of the day it is kind of that meant like it's it's it helps you know when your reps are checking out for the day and you're able to see essentially what happened during the entire day so the sales manager always looks at that at the very end of the day and goes through and reads the every single one and they're able to determine like okay like here was kind of oh we had really bad quality today or okay like there's these missed opportunities here you know or this or like i think this person uh should have closed this person but didn't close them Right, it gives you a very, very good thumb on the pulse of what's happening without, and, it, and it's right into Slack. So without having to log onto your CRM, without having to do any of that stuff, it just pops up as a Slack notification, boom, you do it. So at first you guys should be doing that and eventually your sales manager does it. And then your sales manager overviews all of theirs and then they give you an end of day and the sales managers is like each closer, hey, like Tammy projected four today and did three. She said, you know, here's my thoughts on Tammy. John projected this, did this. Here's my thoughts on John. And then, you know, he's also overall accountable for the team projections. Does that make sense? Cool. So that end of day report is very, very key because the, the clear thing is since you're not on the calls, you try to want to create visibility as much as possible of what's happening on the calls. Otherwise, you don't know if it's the lead. You don't know if it's the closer. You lack an accurate diagnosis. Okay. And what then, Great question. So, so they report their uh, amount of dials. Their, so like they're going to report um, how many leads they got that day, like assigned from the, the, from the rotator. They're going to report how many dials, how many answers, how many meaningful conversations or triages that they have, how many sets, and how many sets closed. And then they just list out any of their triages they had that day and so, what happened. So again, how many dials, how many answers? Yeah, so it's leads assigned, dials, answers, meaningful conversations, sets, and uh, cl set closes, right? So ones that closed. And uh, just so you, I'm sure you guys are going to ask, a meaningful conversation is anybody who gets past the initial, like, 30 seconds of the call, right? Because, like, the initial 30 seconds of an outbound call is essentially trying to, you know, get permission 
to have the next five minutes, right? So it's a meaningful conversation is anything that gets past that, or if they're like texting them and they set up a triage, which is like a 15 minute call, it's, it's, it's that call, if that makes sense. Cool. So uh, big three, right? Proper tracking, end of day reports. You guys got the end of day reports, make sense? Cool. The last one is a daily meeting, which I'm telling you last is because that's the most important one. So if I could only tell you guys to do one thing with your sales team, it's to have a daily meeting. I know Alex Becker doesn't do meetings, but you need to have a daily meeting, right? So you got to have a daily meeting. Now, with that meeting, it's, it's really the centerpiece of the team. And here's how I'd explain the importance of that. I think everybody in this room would agree that, that sales culture is really important to the performance of their sales team. Right? Well, if you do not have an in-person office and you have a virtual company, which is probably most of us here, how does culture take place? Well, it can only take place when two or more people of your company are together at one time. That's the only time culture can take place. Well, if you're a remote company, the only time that is, is the meetings. So therefore, the quality of your meetings is the quality of your culture. And the sales meeting is a centerpiece of the sales culture uh, of your team. It's really the centerpiece of the entire team. And if you do it properly, you'll have your reps saying, oh, I can't wait for the meetings. My favorite part about working here is the meetings. So when we do MPS surveys of our company, which like if you guys probably do MPS surveys of your clients, you do it for internally for your company too. Um, like people are like, man, I love the sales meetings. I get so much value from the sales meetings. So they want, you, you want to make it so they look forward to it and they're growing at the meetings. So the way the meetings work, is it starts with wins and then projections. And then after that, you do training. And there's two types of training. There's either call reviews or role plays, which we do basically call reviews every time. And so the first thing is we, we start the meeting. Everybody's got to be on time. Unless they're running late on a sales call, then they have to post in Slack that they're running late. If they don't post in Slack, if they're late, they get kicked off the meeting. Then they give wins. So like everybody gets on, somebody kicks it off, and they just all give client wins, right? And you really want it to be, you don't want to be calling on people. It needs to be like rapid fire. So they should be like fighting over each other to give wins. And the, the, the time between one rep to give a win to another rep needs to be very quick. So it's like, it should just be like rapid fire, like super high energy from the beginning. And they're always giving client wins. So this does a couple of things. Obviously, they're going to sit there for five minutes listening to how all of the clients are winning. And to be able to gather their wins, they got to go into the wins channel in Slack and, and you know, probably take like, get like five or six wins and write them down because somebody might take their win. Right? So by the nature of going in that Slack channel and reading the wins every day and listening to the wins at the beginning of the sales meeting every day, I mean, what do you think happens? Right? Their conviction is going to go up in the product which what's the most important thing that helps them be persuasive in selling your products is the conviction on the product, right? So that's, how, that's the first thing we do. And it really raises the energy. It, it really does help a lot. Do personal wins? Uh, I mean, you know, if they want to throw in an occasional one, that's fine. But, but I, I really like them doing client wins because it just builds the conviction. Like even for me, like there was not too long ago where I was like really down for some, you know, some reason. And I was like, man, our product sucks. Like we suck. And, um, I was writing a VSL and I had to go get a bunch of wins for the VSL. And after I was done, I felt great. I was like, oh, you know, we're not that bad. You know, like we're actually helping people out here. So it really does make a difference. I mean, if it makes a difference with me, it's going to make a difference with them for sure. Yeah. So like what happens is all of our client success managers, when they get a screenshot or sorry, when somebody slacks them a win or uh, texts them a win or post a win in the group or whatever, they screenshot it and then they always put it in the channel. So just company wide kind of a Yeah, so we got, we got like dozens and dozens and dozens a day, right? And it's all in that channel. And you know, when like the reps get somebody who like messages them and they're like, oh dude, I'm doing so well, goes in the channel. And then when you, when you got to write a VSL, it's super easy, you just look at the channel. And if you need to pick me up, you can just look at the channel. So then we do projections. So, so they go around and they state, okay, so I'm projecting seven for the week, I'm at three, and I'm projecting two today, right? Or I'm projecting one today, okay? 
And so the, the general framework here is that they want to essentially, um, you, you always want them to have an accurate diagnosis and a high self-awareness of where they are, right? So it's like, here's my projection, here's where I'm at, Am I on pace? If I if I am on pace, here's one thing that I'm on. Like, here's one thing that's working for me that you know I want to share with the, uh, everybody else. Or more importantly, if I'm not on pace, here's why I'm not on pace. So John might say, "Gotcha." You know, let's say it's Wednesday. John might say, "Projecting seven this week at one. Obviously not on not on pace. The reason why I'm not on pace is because I had three lined up on Monday, and I thought they were going to come in." Only one came in that I had high no-shows yesterday, so what I'm gonna make up for it is I'm gonna increase my dials for the rest of the week to be able to stack Saturday, also open up Saturday, and get more offers on the board so I can still hit my seven, right? And so every rep has to, you see how that's like high self-awareness? I just made that up, but like you see kind of how it's high self-awareness? Every rep has to have that to where like they, they know where they're at at all times. And you really want there to be a high correlation with your reps between their inputs and their outputs. Right? So they need to know, like, man, if I make this amount of offers this week, I make this amount of dials, I do this amount of lead generation activity, then I'm, I'm gonna likely yield this result. And the, doing the projections every week, what it's going to build is that association of inputs and outputs and just accuracy. You know, So like when our reps say they're gonna project six this week, they project six. If they're like, oh, okay, I'm taking Friday off, I'm going on vacation, they project five, they hit five. You know, you want, you want to make sure they're setting the projections high enough to where they miss it about 20% of the time. Otherwise, they're not, if you, if you read High Output Management by Andy S. Grove, that's where I got this, he sets their KPIs, high, he wants them high enough to where they hit it, even if they did everything perfectly, they put together the perfect week, this is every position, they can only hit it about 80% of the time. Because that's what really challenges people to stretch and grow and all of this stuff. Does that make sense? No, I was just giving an example, okay. but yeah, you know, I don't make them dial necessarily, but like I, like I, they set their own projections. So this is all intrinsic motivation, right? Like I'm not saying, oh, you got to hit seven this week. I'm just like, hey, what are you doing? I'm doing five. Okay, great. You know, like it, it's all about them. And you know, the sales manager is meeting with them at the beginning of every single month and saying, hey, you know, what do you want to hit this quarter? What do you want to hit? Okay, how are you going to break that down? Okay, your quarterly goal is this. So that would mean this amount of commissions. Gotcha, why is that important? What would that do for you? What are the other personal goals you want, what you're doing here at Closures IO to allow you to succeed? So it's really all about like making it all about them and framing it so they're hitting their goals and their targets. And they're making a commitment to themselves and to the company, not about us using, you wanna really use an intrinsic motivation, not extrinsic motivation. Otherwise the rep's gonna burn out. So you really wanna make it all about intrinsic. Uh, Why We Do What We Do by Edward Desi is his book on, on that. That's where I got that. Is there a certain like, bar or a certain, like, um, I guess, number that you just can't go below? If you go below, you know, you can't be in a steam or something like that. Or how do you cut the yeah, bottom? We, we do it by units. And so, like, for us, we want to see, I don't know what it is right now, but I know for a while it was, for our B2C, it was each, we wanted each one of them to at least do probably like the target was at least 25 units, but anything below 20 was like, you're in, you're kind of on a PIP plan for sure. Is the unit the, the set a sale? Oh. Yeah, the unit is a sale. Yeah, so so we do it by units, but I mean obviously if somebody was taking, you know, there's exceptions, right? If they're taking a massive amount of calls and they're okay on units, but their closing rate is eight percent, like we're gonna, we're obviously gonna see that pretty fast. And what about the center? amount of dials that they have to do per day? So or? we actually don't do it by dials. What we do it is by just sets per day and sets closes. So you want to see, in, in general, for us, we want to see the setters doing about, I think it is, four sets a day. Anything below three sets a day is very bad for us. Generally, I tell clients, especially starting off, just building their setting team, minimum two sets a day. If anything less is two sets a day, then they're, they're probably not good. But you also got to make sure, this is very important, that for the group funnel, you have 400, it's, this, the sweet spot's gonna be 400 to 600 group joins per month per setter. The new group joins per month per setter that each setter has to get. For VSL opt-ins, we found the number to be 750 opt-ins per month per setter that they have to get. For low ticket buyers, 
it's gonna be about 400 to 500 low ticket buyers per setter per month. And that's going to be low ticket defined as anything less than 97. If it's mid ticket, like it's like a 500 to 500 plus course, I would say you can get away with 300 or two to 300, probably let's call it 300 buyers per month per setter. You see, I just, I just know this stuff off the top of my head. Yeah, it's like for the setter, is it how many outbound dials per, per month? Was that the numbers? No, so, so what you really want to look for is how many leads you're giving them per month to make sure they have enough, and then how many sets you're getting out of that, right? So, so if you're giving them, I just gave all the recommended lead volume. If you're giving them that, they should at least probably be getting three to four sets per day. Anything, if they're not at least getting two, that's bad. Yep. No, so so okay, thirty thousand. It's it's so seven hundred and fifty leads per month per setter. So if you're getting thirty thousand dollars, thirty thousand a month, that's probably a lot. Is that what you're getting? Yeah, we get like seven fifty to a thousand phone numbers a day, but we don't do anything with them. I'm yeah. Them. Well, I mean, yeah, you're not going to be able to get that many. I mean, you're probably not going to need that many setters. So your ratio might be like fifteen hundred. But I'm just telling you, with us, we've found. We, we've, we've tested all the way up to 1,800 leads per setter per month, new leads per setter per month, and we went all the way down to like four to 500. 750 is the sweet spot. And I've seen that with tons of clients too. How many setters should I close one Huh? So, one set, so one So, so I, I do it more based on the lead, ball, the, how many opt-ins we have. But yeah, the second rule of thumb is typically to follow the one-to-one -one ratio. Yeah, so generally as your team scales, Usually, like, if you have two and two, that's great. Three and three, that's great. Four and four, that's great. As you get up to, like, the five, you can, you know, you might have five and then six setters. Six and then seven setters. It's like the true ratio is probably one to one point, like, one five or something like that. Like, it's, it's barely a little bit more. Like, I think right now for our B to C, we have, we have, like, one or two more setters than we have closers. Be, be the same volume of leads. Sorry? For B to B, what's the volume of leads to the setter for B It's about the same. Really? Yeah. yeah. Well, one thing to consider too, so for B to B, I use what's called, I don't know if you guys have seen my funnel, where it's like I state the, op the first sentence of the copy is the offer, right? So for anything that's in, this is in general, right? For anything that's intent-based, you're gonna need typically less leads in general or less leads per setter per month because it's intent-based, right? If it's a, indirect type of funnel to where like the ad plays heavily off of curiosity just to get the opt-in that's not going to be as a quality of an opt-in you see what i mean if it's a pdf that's really bad you know it's uh, those leads are going to be really rough uh, collect collect phone number on vsl to give the set of the opportunity to right follow. so collect number on the vsl 750 opt-ins per month per setter right and out of that you should see three to four sets a day that are good. Yeah, yeah, you right. could see more, awesome. you could see less. Some setters are, some of them like to just throw a lot on there. Some of them are like, I only want the ones I put on there to close. So some of them kind of have different styles in that way, but I would say generally three to four a day per setter. Yeah, I sure with our guys, we do minimum, they have to do is 10 sets a week, so two a day, if they're working five days a week. And then their ba bare minimum standard for a month is one sale a week. But their their KPI is eight sales, which we'll get in KPIs. But eight sales a month, mm -hmm. so two a week. Mm -hmm. If they set ten, two of them should close, right? Mm -hmm. That's bare minimum, and that will be on on track during between four and eight k a month. Okay, okay. Yeah. Uh, did we hear you correctly? Seven hundred fifty opt-ins per one setter for the month. Per month, yes. It's only like twenty five dials a day. Mm hmm. It's like 30, 30 dials a day, or whatever. Seven fifty divided by thirty. Like forty. I miss it. 30 dials a day, I'm confused. Yeah? Why would it be 30 dials a day? Well, what's 750 divided by 30? You, you said 750 dials a month. So divided not, by 30. Not dials, right? Opt -in, opt -in, 750 dial, opt -in, opt -in. new opt-ins per month per setter. The reason I don't KPI dials is because it doesn't take into account texting and their uh -huh. pipeline. Right? Like, oh, like so that's why I we're, we're very not process-oriented with our sales team. We're very outcome-oriented. Like, I, I want to put the guys on the field and, and have them put points on the board. Like I, I consult, uh, for instance, with, with Tony Robbins' team. They have a real big issue, 
and I've been really trying to get them to not do this, of like they require their salespeople to do a certain, you need to do this amount of LinkedIn messages, you need to do this amount of outbound dials, you need to do this amount of emails. And then when they do an email, it creates another task. And then they gotta do that task. So they, their, their whole job becomes clear in tasks. You do not wanna do that. Because now they're more focusing on not getting in trouble and just clearing the tasks opposed to making money which when they make money, you make money. So you wanna give them the best practices. You wanna give them a framework, but you wanna say, hey dude, go out there and make some money. Now, if, if the dude's not doing any sets, if he's making one set a day, and you look at his dials, and he's making $20 a day, you gotta have a conversation and say, hey, do you wanna be here or not? Because you're, you're not getting the results, and you're making $20 a day. But like, one thing that our setters will do is when they set people who don't close, they'll continue to follow up with those people and send them my YouTube videos. They'll send them a PDF. They'll say, hey, how's it going? They'll say they'll use a reoffer, which is a really good follow-up message that we use, right? They'll also, uh, they'll text every lead that comes in and set up triages, right? So like sometimes our setter's dials will only be 20 to 30 a day, but that's because they're stacked on triages, right? They'll, they'll have, they'll, they'll, you know, be texting leads all weekend and line up their Monday with like 10 30 minute calls. So they're gonna make 30 dials that, you see what I mean? So like, you see how if I KPI them on dials, I'm not necessarily incentivizing them to do what's gonna make them the most money. So I kinda, of, we, we do track it, because if they're not getting the results and they're not making a lot of dials, I'm like, what are you doing? You know? But like, it, it just depends. So like a lot of times they'll, one day they will not have a lot of dials because they'll have a lot of triages set. And then, you know, maybe on Tuesday, they don't have as many and you'll see their dials spike up to 150. You see what I mean? Yeah, or 200 even. Yeah, I think the the disconnect was 750 new opt-ins, dialing them all once is only like 30 a day roughly. But of course you're not dialing that oh, one. Oh, you mean 30 it's leads a day. Over, it's going to compound over yes. time and you're going to be working those people multiple hours. Right, multiple exactly, times. right? So yeah. it's 30 new leads a day. They're going to hit up those people and then they're going to go back and hit up the ones from yesterday, the ones from the day before. And I would say with opt-ins, yes. once you get about three to four, you know, I know the whole thing about like, 15 touches over, I'm just telling you what I've experienced. If they're really working the leads, uh, once it gets past that three to four day mark, they just need to like re go, go back to the newest leads and just work back. I, I have a saying, I'd rather call a new lead seven times than call seven day old leads. You know, you heard the statistic like DocuSign did a study or something and it's like, if you call within five minutes, you're like, 21 times more likely to get a appointment than if you call in two hours or something. I forget the exact statistic. But you know, speed to lead is, is very well, you know, documented as probably the most important thing for your setters. Well, it's also the one touch point. So if you're rewarding dial, that's the wrong metric. It doesn't make any sense because you're gonna text, email, and call. Yeah. Right. The person that's three touches way more likely. Yes. Yeah, and keep in mind. Yeah, and keep in mind, like they, they do say that seven to fifteen touch points. I'd rather just have those touch points in forty-eight hours, opposed or seventy-two hours, opposed to over the course of ten days. Not too much. No, you just gotta want to get a hold of the person. Like act like you're actually trying to get a hold of the person, and you will get a hold of them. Typically, keep in mind too uh, with setters. We double dial, so we dial, we hang up, we dial again, then we text. We never leave voicemail, and we don't, we, we don't email either. Uh, if we, maybe if we had a better software that we could pop them out, we would email. But my, my autoresponder acts like it's a setter sometimes. So we'll send out emails from me, but I also send out ones acting like it's the setter. Hang up immediately, or you wait. Till we don't. It goes we don't hang voicemail. up on them, right? <laughs> yeah. So, so like, like, as soon as it goes to voicemail, that'd be a good tactic. Oh, yeah. Okay. <laughs> yeah okay. So, no, no. I so, so yeah. So, because like you, you, when somebody calls you twice, you're more likely to answer. Yeah, yeah. The other yeah, thing, no, no, I, I'm kind of hopping around, but you... the other thing. So, double dialing is key. Uh, the other thing that is very key is using local presence, which means that like if you live in Arizona the numbers that call you are gonna pop up as an, as an Arizona area code. So, so you can imagine, if you get one dial from some crazy number, but then you get two dials from the same area code as you back to back, you're more likely to answer that. What software do you use for that? So we use Allaware, but I will say, there, 
there, there's a big software gap right now for a good dialer. So. Alloware, A-L-O-W-A-R-E. Yeah, the, the problem we find is that there's, there's a lot of good ones with local presence and a good dialer and all that stuff. Uh, and there's some that have the text function, but there's not really a good one that has both the text function and the, um, the local presence and the power dialer. So yeah, there, there, there's a good opportunity of something that has all of those and that and integrates with HubSpot, because we use HubSpot. What is the Alloware, yeah. Alloware, We use both, yeah. Okay. We, we're going to try actually using what's called Orum, which is O-R-U-M. This dialer rips. I mean, it's so fast. And you can do a parallel dialer, which what happens is you call 20 people at once, and then it connects you with anybody who it answers. So we're going to try that, and then we're going to keep Alloware just for texting. So that might be a new thing, but then again, like, kind of janky. What happens if multiple people answer? I don't know. <laughs> yeah, I don't know. So the way those typically work is uh, it's a queue. So like Close has it, it's called a predictive dialer. So it'll call multiple people at once, and you have multiple people on the back end in a queue. And as people pick up, Close will direct the call to that person. So you don't have just have one person using it, you have multiple people oh, using it. Oh, I get you. Yeah. yeah. So uh, moving on, right? So big, big thing is, is you all should do a daily sales meeting for an hour, right? And I'm telling you it makes a huge difference. And the most important part of this, actually really the most important part is projections because that's really the accountability and where you help, help them build their self-awareness to where if they're not getting the results, why are they not getting results? Because once you have a, a rep that can self-regulate to the point to where they, if they're not on pace for their numbers, they can self-diagnose of why they're not on pace, it makes it much, much easier on you. And then with the training, we do a call review every single day. And so what you do is you look at the end of day reports from yesterday and you look at all the, the console summaries, and you can usually find, oh, that one looks a little fishy, right? Uh, that one, why was it a, why was it a five pay, and it, you know, this person was a, you know, a lawyer or something, I don't know. But like, you look at these ones that are fishy, and you pull up a couple of those, you have the VA pull up a couple of those, then you just do a random call review. And then typically what you wanna do is you wanna find one to two things for them to work on in that call review. Once you find it, you point it out, you identify it, you teach why it's wrong, you teach what to do differently, you ask if that makes sense, and then you demonstrate you doing that effectively, and then you ask them to demonstrate it back to you. That's the framework you wanna use. So just make sure, like when I used to do call reviews with my sales team, and I, admittedly I still do this a little bit, is I would just eviscerate them. I'd just be like, this is wrong, 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 you suck, this is wrong, this is wrong. And that just doesn't work very well. Like they get demoralized, they overthink it, they're just changing everything all at once. So you wanna find one thing. It's like Mark Robert says, uh, you know, he, he hurt his wrist one time because his uh, golf instructor was like, turn your wrist like this, bend your knees, bend over this way, like, like pull your arms out this. And it was so many things at once to where he became really awkward. Whereas when he took like 50 swings and the golf instructor's like, yeah, just bend your knees a little bit and then take another 50 swings. That's what you want to do with your sales team. Does it make sense? Cool. So that's training. Uh, any questions on that? You mentioned to get the leads. Uh, I've seen a lot of VSLs where they're not collecting phone numbers. Are you saying collect phone numbers so they can call directly? Is that yes. that's practice? Okay. Yeah. Yeah, and there's a ClickFunnels script that uh, validates the phone number. I have that. Concern. Yeah. Cool. So when to hire? Would they count as a? Would, would they count as one of the 750? Lead magnets, yeah, like, like PDFs. PDFs so yeah, here's what I've experienced with PDFs. The the like you can get them real cheap, right? You can get them yeah. for like five bucks, but the quality is horrible. So what happens is there is a certain like critical mass that you hit where you have so many bad leads, it's like really hard for your setter to sift through them. So I found the PDF is as far beyond that critical mass. So what I recommend if you're gonna do a PDF is you do the PDF and then the, the, the person only texts those leads and then on the thank you page, you offer a free course and then the free course is in either, you know, you could either put it in school and then have them join school and have your people lead jump from school or if you're gonna do a Facebook group, it's in the units of the Facebook group. And so you, you just make one that's like, hey, your PDF's gonna be in your inbox in 10 minutes. In the meantime, I also wanna give you my previously 1K course of how to X without Y for free. 
all you got to do is, is here's how to access it. And when you, when you give them that hook to get into the group, you'll get a really good percentage of those opt-ins to get into the group. That's the most effective way I've ever seen to build your Facebook group. You never, don't run a, ever run an ad saying, join my group. Nobody wants to join a group. Everybody hates Facebook groups. But they want, to, you know, they want the PDF, and then as, you know, it's kind of a micro commitment. And then they're like, oh, okay, the free, cor the free course, okay, I'll get in there. And then the setters lead gen them off the group join. Yeah, so the group join is really, really big for, for that model. So do you find the free course better or like the most thing like 27? Yeah, so, so here, here, here's how I, uh, how, how I do it is I would say the best model that I run is the VSL, right? And then having the setters call the opt-ins. However, if you do not have your messaging down really well or like, you know, you, you're just still trying to figure out your VSL or maybe you don't have enough budget for ad spend, I recommend people start off with the group, get down their messaging, and they're building an asset that's always going to be there. They'll, they'll build it in their email list, right? So start off with that, and then you progress kind of to the VSL, the call funnel. And then in terms of low ticket, I don't have direct experience. I'm actually trying to validate that now. I would imagine, though, um, that after you really get the setters dialed in in terms of calling the opt-ins, then pivoting to something that liquidates all of your ad spend and then utilizing your outbound team purely for your appointments is going to be the most superior model. So like for us, I, I mentioned this uh, yesterday, but we did 346 sales in April. And 266 were from the setters, 40 are from email, 40 are from at them actually watching the VSL and booking, just 40 out of, of that huge number. So. What I realized is like, well, so few are coming from the VSL that I might as well be selling them a product in the VSL to liquidate my ad spend and then just having the setters continue to call the opt-ins and then also the buyers. So like, I kind of think that's the evolution of, of the acquisition. Now, if, you're, if you've got a YouTube channel or you've got a good organic following, just go right to a call. Because my clients who have YouTube channels and they just, you know, whether they put their link in the description or a mid-roll or whatever they do, I mean, those, the, those people will show up at like 80 to 90% and they'll close outrageously well. It's like laughable. It's the best quality leads ever. But if you're like me and you gotta you know, do the whole paid traffic thing, yeah, that's kind of how I think about it. Totally that makes sense. Um, yep. Sorry, uh, can you just go back real quick on the tracking? I know in your, in your course, you, know, you show all the different things to track. It's a super long list. Yeah. You got the dashboard there and it's awesome. Thank you. Uh, if you were to build a very simple dashboard with the most you know, key metrics, I think you mentioned earlier, like four or five of them, what would those be? Right, well, like for setters? No, no, sorry, for, for the closer. For closers? Yeah, just well, the top. I'll, I'll just, I mean, number one, for closers, most important thing, upfront cash collected, right? Day one cash collected. Second most important thing, closes, which is kind of the same thing. For setters, sets, set closes, you know? Now after, for closers, you so say you have front end cash collected, or upfront cash collected, you have uh, closes. After that, I would say live calls and scheduled calls. Right, scheduled is like how many were scheduled, live is actually how many showed up. Those would be the, the, the very, very baseline. And then for setters, I mean the main thing is I wanna look at, really to be honest, is if I just look at how many leads were they assigned versus how many sets did they get, and then how many of those sets showed up and actually closed, I'm going to really get everything I need for the most part. When you say live calls and scheduled calls, are you talking about the close rate or the actual quantity? So scheduled would be like, I woke up today and my calendar had six calls on the calendar. Live is like, out of those six, only four showed up. The, the close rate, you're talking actual action. Yeah, so the, the, the close rate is the closes divided by the live calls. Never do your close rate based on offers or based on like, uh, you wanna do your close rate of anybody who actually answers the phone. Otherwise your closers will, will mess with it. They'll, they'll, they'll not make an offer to preserve their close rate. You know? There's, there's one step further, right? When it's like close rate based on schedule calls. So even if it's a no-show, they're chasing the no-show and incentivize. Yeah, and you can even look at that too, yeah. Which one do you actually look at? We look at live, but like, I, but, but honestly we look at both. You know, but you gotta remember, we base our entire team, everything is about units and upfront cash collected. So like at the end of the day, we're not talking about what's your close rate. We never talk about close rates. That doesn't mean I don't look at it, but like we never talk about it because you can mess with your close rate. It's like an arbitrary metric. We just look at production. 
you know? And then, yeah, if somebody's just taking 16 calls a day, they're barely closing anything. I mean, that's, but you're not going to run into situations like that very often. So you just really want to look at production, and then everything else kind of falls in place. So we, we you know, we, we kind of have a KPI on close rate, but honestly, it's like, it, the closures can manipulate it so well that uh, I, just I just look at their production. cash collected, wouldn't those occur on the same call or are they? Yeah, they do. Okay. Yeah, but like, you know, you, you really want to incentivize the closers to get as many pay in fulls or like two pays as possible and not as many three or four pays. So this is a good tactic for you guys. Last month, we, we used to only project on units and um, the upfront day one cash collected wasn't as high as I wanted it to be. So I told our, uh, I told our salesman, maybe it was his idea actually, I shouldn't take credit for it. I think it was his idea. And he just said, I'm just gonna have him project upfront cash collected too. So they're gonna have two projections. And literally our upfront day one cash, I think went up by like 50%. It was like insane. It was coming off of a bad month. So like the, 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 the rise was more meteoric than probably normal. But yeah, they, we literally had probably 30, 40%, 50% increase in day one cash collected off the same amount of deals just from changing how they're projecting their numbers. Not changing incentive to reward more on upfront. No, there's no incentive changes. I mean, they get paid more if they collect more upfront. So that's the incentive, right? I don't need to add more. Um, so in terms of when to hire, who's, who's was when to hire, by the way? Somebody forgot. Was that you, Vanessa? When to hire? When? I think I Well, you asked oh, about okay. ramp, yes. Um, I think it was mine. It's kind of very similar questions. So, I mean, when to hire, like, I always say that, you know, first of all, you got to ask yourself, why are you hiring? You know, you're either hiring to buy back one of your time or an executive's time and or to alleviate a current constraint in your business. Right, like really a hire should be there to either buy back your time or your executive's time or to alleviate a current constraint in your business or build for, sort, uh, for, for future growth. My, so, my volume is so low because yeah, so, could my seller be my closer as well? Definitely well, yeah, to. I think for you, you'd probably have to pay a base because there's just not enough, there's not even enough leads out there like incoming. But if you paid a base, that's fine. Okay. Um, you know, for, so here's what I recommend for closers, you want to be able to provide at least three new calls a day for the closer, right? Generally, if you're going to be 100% commission, all of that stuff. If you're going to throw in some bases and do all that stuff, I mean, yeah, you could work the position differently. Like if, if you got somebody who's traveling to you, with you to events, they're, you know, handling a bunch of different promotions. Yeah, you got to comp them differently. But 100% commission, I would say, for, and for most of you guys, three calls a day minimum. And then for setters, it's it's the stuff I said earlier. For opt-ins, 750 per month per setter. For group joins, it's about 400 to 600 per month per setter. For buyers, it's about probably 500 to 600 a month per setter. Yeah. Um, so that, that that's really it for that. And you know, you just gotta ask yourself what constraint you're having, right? If you want to get more appointments out of the same amount of ad spend because your ROAS is like kind of shrinking because you're at scale, setters are really good for that. If you got 20x ROAS though. I mean, you know, you really don't need to be adding setters. I would just scale your ads. You see what I mean? So setters are great for that. They're great for obviously more appointment volume, but especially more appointment volume out of the same amount of ad spend. So they're, they're great for creating more efficiency within your marketing system. Then with closers, the constraint it's alleviating is availability. So if you're at a place where you're like, man, I could, I could scale a lot further if we just had more spots for calls. Like I could easily scale my ads. I could easily up the marketing then you should hire a closer. Or if you're doing all the sales calls yourself and you're like, man, this is taking up a lot of my time and I really don't like it, and I'm, and I'm, good, at it, I'm good at it enough to be able to transfer that skill to somebody else, then, then that's a great time to hire a closer. Kind of an aspect strategy to a quick 15 minute call to kind of pre-vet them and then jump on an hour long call with the pre-vetted people. What are your thoughts on that? Oh, so you mean like a 15 to 60? Yeah. Yeah, so if you're the founder, I think that's okay. Generally though, the 1560 model, I've never found to outperform just direct to a 60 minute call. For, for most coaching and like 
B2C type offers, right? If you're B2B and it's more of a enterprise sale or it's a little bit more higher level, then, then yeah, you, you, know, you might have to do a two call close and you could do it with a setter and then a closer. But I also find if, if you're talking a big deal price and um, it's a longer sales cycle, it's more B2B, you should just have the closer do the first call and the second call. Because like the setter usually doesn't really help the effort there with the fifth, there's not, they're not providing any value at all. It's just, yeah. But yeah, for founders, like you could, you can have somebody do the pre-qualifying. Hey, Cole, do you hire a sales, sales manager? Well, so, okay, we'll jump, we'll jump to here then. Um, so again, typically, you know, you're doing all the sales calls, right? You bring on the salespeople. Now you're the full-time sales manager. I typically recommend around somewhere between three to four sales reps. You identify somebody that could be the lead, right? So a closing lead. And what you do is you give that person a very, very, very small base and you tell them, hey, I want you to be the future sales manager. And then you just give them a small amount of responsibility. So, you know, they run the meetings when you're gone. They um, maybe do like 10 call reviews a week just like kind of recorded call reviews, sending some other closers feedback. Maybe they take some guys in a breakout room uh, during the meeting and they coach them a little bit. But it's kind of like a tryout. But you don't want to pay them more than like 1500 bucks a month. Just very, very, very small. Because, and you should read uh, Sales Management Simplified for this. There's something called the, the fallacy of a player coach in sales. Historically, sales managers who, or sales leads, I guess you could say, who are trying to manage a team and also uh, sell themselves, they're terrible, okay? They do really, really, really bad. And it's because, uh, you know, opposed, in, in, player coaches also, they work in any other position I've seen in a company, they just do not work in sales. And we even test, we, we thought we were, I had read all about this, all the literature said that like, don't do it. And I thought I was, oh, well we can make it work because we're, we're the best. And I tried it, it was just a terrible idea. You just don't get, you know, you're, you're gonna overpay them and not get nearly enough output that you want from them. And it's just because with sales, if you're selling, it's, it's a total selfish mindset, right? And I don't mean selfish like you only care about, you know, yourself and you're a narcissist. I just mean like you're, you're thinking about, you know, essentially how can you make the most money because that's going to make the company the most money. And you could always do more prospecting, you could always take more calls, you could always make more offers, you could always nurture your pipeline more. It's, it's one mindset. But sales management is totally selfless. You're passing all the, all the accolades to your reps. And there's also no limit to the amount of coaching and amount of pouring in you can do to the reps. And so I find that trying to have somebody do both is very, very hard. And even if you have somebody who does both and you're like, well, you know, they're doing pretty good. I guarantee they would do better if you just had them do one or the other. I can't tell you how many times I've seen people, they're like, well, my, my reps, you know, this rep's doing a lot of revenue for me. Like, I'm just scared to like take them off calls. It's just like, well, like you should be more scared of your other reps not being as good as that rep. But the only way that rep's going to be able to transfer their skill set to somebody else is if you take them off calls and allow their full-time responsibility to be getting all those people selling like they're selling. And that's when really the team starts to rise all up. So it's very, very key. So what you want to do is around three to four closers, um, you know, if you really want to get out of it, try to identify your superstar. Usually at four people, you end up kind of having this person who's like pretty good. And then so you kind of make them a sales lead and you start really just kind of trying to pour into them and train them and like see how they're coaching and gives them feedback, but very minor responsibility, they're still selling. And then when they're ready, you move them up into a sales manager. And then that's when you give them all the responsibilities minus the team meetings. So you do the team meetings every single day, but you have them do everything else. So they do the hiring, the ramp, I mean, you might do the final interview on the hiring, but they do the initial hiring, they do the ramping, they do the training, uh, they'll do the, the meetings when you're not there. They do all the one-on-ones with the sales reps and they'll do a certain amount of sale, uh, call reviews per sales rep per week, right? And so once you have them there, you do the meetings and you hold on to the meetings and that's just to place guardrails on your team. Because a lot of times that I've seen very many times is you hire up the sales manager and you're so sick of sales management to where you're like, well, thank God that's over. And then you're gone, right? I mean, it's just the pendulum swing, right? It happens constantly. And then the sales manager, like, you didn't give them enough coaching, you didn't grow them well enough, you didn't give them enough feedback, and then they kind of take over, and what happens is, the reps will only be as good as that manager. Well, if they're not trained properly, they're not doing their job, et cetera, 
that the team starts to falter, right? And then it's three months later and you're like, man, I've been working on the marketing, my sales team sucks now. And you go back to the sales team and then you, you start digging in and you just figure out it's a mess. You lost your culture, you lost everything. Then when you take it back over, everybody quits. So this, that, that's what happens when people usually, they, their sales team stinks. And so they hire us and, every, and like that happens and I'm like, okay, well, you gotta let go of that person. And, yeah, so that's how you prevent that. You hold on to the sales meetings, and then what you do is it's a volume knob, not a light switch. Right? So you're doing five meetings a week, and you say, dude, you run the Friday meeting, because you're no longer doing the Fridays. Then you're like, okay, you got Fridays and you got Wednesdays. Right? And then you're like, okay, you got Tuesday, Wednesday, and Friday. I want to do Monday and Thursday. That way you can kind of like, you're there twice a week, and then you give away Thursday. And then you're only doing Monday, which is the most important day, because that's when you're setting the projections and kicking off the week on the right start. And then eventually, you'll get to this point where you're like, honestly, like, it's kind of weird for me to be here. Like, it's like you feel like it's like, I don't know, it's like, you, you, you almost like, it's not even like my team, like, you're, you're better at this now. So like, when you gotta get to that point, you just give away the Mondays, and then you just pop in whenever, see how it's going, pump them up, make an announcement, but then you're good. And you can do that pretty quickly. But you know, you just slowly phase it out. And then that way you know your, your team's gonna be on lock. Right? So did that answer your question with sales managers? Yeah, th there's a lot to it. I mean I have two. But um one situation if I have two salespeople already and um, they close at thirty five to forty percent currently. But um, I'm not doing much of a sales management, so they just they're just responsible for reporting their yeah. uh, we only have two people, closing. it's See, it's just. Uh, I really, I know we can do better if we had a sales manager, but is it? Well, if they're closing 35%, I don't know if you really need one. Okay. Yeah, I think you should just, you know, do the daily meetings with the guys, review the calls. One hour a day. Yeah, you're, like, you're yeah. good. It's two people. Yeah. Right? But when you have, like, especially if you have three set, like four setters, four closers, that's when it starts to get to the point where, like, you really need somebody to take over. And when you hire that sales manager, I recommend having, to, having them do both the setters and the closers until they get 12 direct reports, and then you hire the setter lead and the setter manager. Yeah, and then they have six and six, and they start kind of building back up. How long do your sales meetings last on the morning, your daily check-ins? How long does that for me last? Hour. One hour. Every day, yeah. No matter what. Don't do the 15, you gotta do the hour. Well, it's some sort of tech thing through HubSpot and integrations. I don't, I don't know. I like pay people, I pay people to figure that out. Sort them like round automatically. Yeah, it's just round robin. Mm, round yeah. robin. Yeah. Cool. So b ramp time with building us. Do you want to expand on your question? What is like this first step to the last step? Like how long would it realistically take to get to a place of actually having a sales team that runs without you. Sure. Like what's, is it three months, six months? Like what's, what's the expected oh, range? It'd be quicker than that. I mean, so like, first of all, you got, okay, let's say you want to hire, here, here's the perfect scenario, right? If you can generate six to seven, eight calls a day, that, that range, potentially, if you could generate that, then, you know, first step is, okay, like am I, do I know how to sell this, right? If you know how to sell it, okay, great, you have that. Then what you want to do is you want to go out there and you want to hire two. Right, so that's, that's called the rule of two. And the reason you wanna do that is when it's the first time you're hiring a sales team, you don't know what you don't know. Like, it's like if you, like for instance, like I, I've never built a development team, but I imagine, you know, I probably am not gonna be very good at hiring a developer, because I have no idea what, you know, I, I don't even know what a good one looks like, you know? So, like now, I can, I can tell you exactly what a good salesperson is gonna look like, but if you've done it for the first time, you're not gonna know. So the best thing to do is hire people you think are gonna be good, and then hire two, and then that way, if they both work out, great. You have appointments for both. If one works out, but one doesn't work out, you're like, okay, I got one. If they both don't work out, then usually you gotta look to yourself and you're like, okay, well, like, well were they not coachable? Did I not give them the support? Was the, were the leads bad? Because either you just made a really unlucky hiring decision or it's probably you. You know, am I a bad leader? What's going on? So you hire two. Then once you have two, Typically, I, I do the first uh, seven days is kind of them just drinking from the fire hose and learning like what you sell, why you sell it, the mission, vision, and values of the company, going through all of the testimonials, going through kind of your sales training of how you sell, and then just a bunch of call reviews, right? Or a bunch of call recordings of yours. So that, that's kind of step one. They sort of drink from the fire hose, and then they can also um, 
shadow you on your calls, just on Zoom. Are you showing them calls that are closed, or just a mixture of all types of calls? I mean, I would show them the ones that are closed, yeah. Or just whatever ones you think are good. And then, so that's the first seven days. The second seven days, what I would do is I would give them half volume, right? So, and, you know, if you wanted to get kind of ballsy, you could just, you could just let them go. But generally, I give them half volume, so it's like three calls a day. So they would each have three calls a day. And you just keep a quick, uh, tight feedback loop with them, right? So you're looking at their end of day reports, you're having your daily sales meeting, and then you just want to make sure you're reviewing a couple of the calls a day. And you don't have to like sit there and listen to the entire call. Just kind of skim through. It'll take you like 20, 30 minutes a day. Skim through at 20, two, uh, 2x speed. And you can kind of get a feel like of how this person's doing. So you let them do that for the second week. And then the third week, you just let them go, right? And then you, know, you just do the daily meeting. You look at the end of day reports. You do your one-on-ones with them, which is like uh, you know, bi-weekly if you have, weekly if you have time. If you don't have time, just do bi-weekly. So you do your one-on-ones. And then um, you just continue to do the call reviews and everything. And the, the, most of the training happens in the meeting. So that's really the ramp. I mean, that's, there's a little bit more to it, but just to like simplify it the easiest way, I would say that. Would you say that in the beginning stages, you really have to white knuckle this yourself, doing six to seven calls a day? We don't always have to do six or seven, right? Yeah. I'm just saying if you have six or seven, you could hire two because that way each could get three. Yeah. When the, in the ramp Do you phase. feel like it is mandatory as a CEO that you do sales calls yourself first? And if so, for how long do you do them for until you like? I mean, you could, you could do it for like, I mean, it, honestly, you could do it as little as for two to three weeks. You just have to know how to sell your thing. So as, as little time as it takes for you to say, okay, number one, I know how to sell this. Good enough to where I can teach somebody else how to sell it, you know, for, for, the, for the basic part. That's number one. And then number two, just making sure you have enough lead flow. Yeah, then you're ready. And you don't have to be a sales expert. Just remember, like, you're the world's foremost expert in selling your own product or service because nobody else knows what your product or service even is. So if you could sell it pretty well, they're going to be able to sell it. And then for you specifically, um, it's going to be a lot easier because all your traffic's off YouTube. Yeah. I mean, much easier. If it's cold traffic, they got to be a little bit better, right? YouTube, they're going to be like taking some orders probably. Okay, thank you. Cool. So follow up on that call. Do you not recommend having just one salesperson on the team ever? Do you always recommend well, it having it two? Well, it depends. I, I always like two, but if you could only generate leads for one because you're kind of still figuring out lead gen, then one is okay, you know? Um, like for instance, if, like if you have ads working, let's say you have a call funnel working, I don't know why you wouldn't have two, right? But let's say you're kind of, you're using your email list a little bit, you're using Instagram, but you really don't have that system in which you can pull the lever and like scale your leads, then maybe you can only do one for now because you don't have lead flow for two. But three, four calls a day, they're not making enough money. Well, you would want to ramp them to where they're making six, like they're doing six calls a day. And how do you manage the lead flow? Because we've had the experience, it's up and down, up and down, and so many complaints, and not enough lead flow. Yeah. Well, I mean, that's a marketing thing, right? So you got to look at your marketing and why it's inconsistent. You know? It just comes down to, comes down to that. Um, cool. So consistency. Who asked about consistency? Y'all forgot. Who has a, I want to make sure I'm like answering questions of somebody who, who has it, so. Let's talk about consistency, so. Okay. <laughs> yeah, and it's in terms of like getting them to perform, obviously you do the daily call, which has been Right, so, so a big part well. is the big three. Yeah. But I'll give you the other big tactic for this, is you want them to pull, like you want them to create a greatest hits list of all their best calls. And then what you want to do is help them establish a morning routine where in somewhere in that routine, they listen to one of their wins at 2x speed every single day. That is the biggest, 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 biggest thing. Because it reminds them that they, like, have you ever been a sales slump? You, you kind of like, did I forget how to do this? You know, do I, do I know, did I forget this sales thing? Like, am I, like, you, you start getting in your head, like, you don't even know what you're doing. So you got to listen to wins every single day. You know, preferably in the morning in their morning routine. That's the easiest way to make sure they do it. Like what I used to do is I used to work out every morning. So I would listen to a win at the beginning of my workout and I just played a 2x speed off my phone. And then that way I get through it and the rest of my workout I listen to whatever I wanted to. But it's like a passive listen. 
Like you're not really listening to it in terms of like studying it, right? You're just like listening to yourself win and you're listening to somebody give you their credit card. That is the number one biggest thing, right? So other than that, um, there's a couple of things with consistency with reps. And this is really consistency with your entire team. Number one is their energy, right? So like, where is their energy at biologically? So do they have, uh, are they, you know, going to bed at the same time every night? Are they waking up at the same time every day? Are they eating well? Sunlight, like all the stuff that you guys already probably know how to do, you'd be surprised. Like they just don't do it, right? So like that's the first thing you want to look at, sleep, nutrition, exercise, all of that stuff. The next thing is like, are they inspired? You know, do they, are they, are they bought into your mission, vision, and values? Are they excited about something in terms of, do they have something to look forward to? Um, are they reading something that's like inspiring them? You know, like what is like their vision? Is there something they're trying to attain within the company that they're looking for? Like you probably have had the experience of like somebody who's on the uh, precipice of like getting a promotion. They're really working towards it because they know they can get this promotion. Maybe it's being the sales manager or something. Like you just get crazy output from that person because they have a vision and they know how to get there and they feel like the light is at the end of the tunnel, right? So you wanna kind of help them engineer those things. And then, um, yeah, I mean, I, I would say that's the big thing. I was gonna say necessity is the other one, but that's just like, do they have strong reasons why those goals are important to them? And then I think it's also just keeping their calendars full. Well, of course, what yeah. What we found is like when they, if you have full calendars, they perform better yes regardless. yes that's true yeah you, you want you want that the calendar be a solid color so there's a rhythm to it you know for sure well i just listen to them yeah. i mean i just listen to the calls or my sales man i mean so we're reviewing calls every single day right and then the sales manager like when you have a full-time one what they'll do is it really depends on how many reps you have. The key is to pull up a bunch of calls, like have a VA just give you all the Zoom links, and then you just go through like the first 10 minutes and the last 10 minutes, and you do it at 2x speed. And you can actually like, I, I can get through 15 calls in like 90 minutes, right? Like it's, you just wanna go through them really, really quickly, and you'll be able to see. Sometimes it's like, no, you guys stink. Other times you're like, wow, I didn't even realize like that, like, I, you know, you, you're getting people out of the dark depths of Facebook, yeah. right? So like, I mean, that's happened to me too, where I've been like, oh, I, wow, I didn't realize our leads were this bad. And that's good for you to know. Because my default was always like, no, you guys suck. Yeah. All right, so yeah, the, the way you know is just by listening to the calls. So you, you said, sorry, I couldn't quite hear you. You said something about uh, your VA something calls, something review. Did you? Yeah, so I mean, like the VA just will, like, I'll, I'll, like if I'm doing it, I'll ask the VA to pull, I'll be like, pull, I'll look at the end of the airports, and I'll ask the VA, I'll be like, pull this call, 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 and so they put it all on a Google Doc, and then I go through it really quickly. Now, I don't do that very often. Our, like our sales manager is just gonna listen to the, the calls almost every day, right, and just be going through a ton of calls, a ton of calls. I mean, management, if I can boil it down, especially sales management, it's not, you know, messing with the CRM or the script or like any of this stuff. Literally the only thing that it is, is reviewing the calls and coaching the reps. And then also helping them personally and professionally and develop as, as human beings, obviously. But like most managers, they, who are immature, they just try to do all this other stuff. Like, yeah, let's create this new CRM and do this and do, like this new, tr they wanna create dashboards. That's the big one. Like, you know your manager's not doing their job and they just start making a bunch of dashboards. You're like, what was wrong with the last dashboard? You know? But what they should be doing is literally just reviewing calls, pouring into the reps. Reviewing calls, pouring into the reps. Like, that, it's, it's, the issue is it's just monotonous and it's boring, you know? But that's why they don't want to do it. And they don't get any accolades or prestige or status from doing it, right? Who's getting it? The reps that are closing the deals. They're the ones that are getting the status and prestige and all that stuff. You know, so like they have issues with that. And so they need to really be this like selfless type of person who pours into their, their, their peoples. Do you find that experienced reps get tired of doing the same thing over and over again? They reach that point, they're making 20, 25K. 
whatever and they're just like I want something I want to keep growing I mean mm. is that a risk that you see and yeah I mean it happens right and sometimes you can't do anything about it other times like that's the person who ends up being your sales manager other times like you gotta like maybe you can teach them some other thing in the company sometimes like you can't do anything they just got to go usually that you want I don't, you know it's, it's hard to say man like people are different um, but you know I would say anywhere from 18 months to two years you could start to experience some of that but mm -hmm. dude I also know some reps that have been chilling and just crushing it for like five years yeah. you have a place sales reps into the UK region uh -huh. and if you do it on that like commission only basis as well yeah I'm not, from my whole network, I don't know anyone who doesn't get a salary. Just, oh. It's just unheard of. Yeah, I mean, if there, if, I don't know. I, we have people from the UK on our team that are You're seeing it, yeah. commissioned. But they're like, you know, they, they, they get the space. Like, they, they kind of get it, right? I mean, if you were hiring off some sort of job, if they had no idea what your company did, then, yeah, that might be a barrier. Oh, so the yeah. sales call for that's how people are Zoom. Yeah, I think I think it didn't. I think it was kind of like whatever the client wanted to do before COVID. Since COVID, I definitely think Zoom. And uh, so you have a lead on the calendar. It's time when they appointment. They don't join the Zoom. Do you still take the call? Go through the meeting on the phone, or are you force them to join the Zoom call? Well, yeah, yeah. So we 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 try to force them to join. Okay. We just say it's not going to make any sense if they can't see our screen. To just cancel it, pretty much if they're not. We're not going to cancel it, but we're they'll join. Yeah. Is that B2C also, or just B2B? Both. Yeah, it just makes a difference. If your sales reps are good, it just like if they tell you no, I just I want them to look look me in the eye. You know, tell me. Question. <laughs> <laughs> totally. Do you feel there's a difference between, say, for example, our offer, B2C, Amazon people who are looking around at various biz ops, they're not that sophisticated, probably haven't maybe used Zoom before kind of thing, um, aren't used to that scenario, right? Versus a sales professional who's looking to be a sales rep or whatever. Well, ours are biz op too. But I mean, they're kind of a different breed, no? Like no, because our messaging is like, don't do Amazon, do closing. <laughs> <laughs> so. Yeah. Yeah. So it's, so you're it, it's, it's like it's like oh like don't do these make money opportunities like uh -huh. learn a skill that you can make money and it's easier like it's it's kind of hard. so we we get the whole thing like oh like yeah I was trying to do print on demand but it didn't work you know they they get all that stuff okay huh. so he's saying it's the same same thing um, how do you manage a sales team without having experience in sales without having a desire to do that. Well, I mean, those are two different questions, right? So with what experience, I would say number one, like really leading and managing a sales team is not much, it's, it's very, very similar to leading and managing all the other teams. I mean, you know, it's, it's, it's obviously gonna be different than operations or a development team, but in terms of leading your coaches, very, very similar, right? In terms of how I lead my marketing team, yeah, pretty similar. You know, there's differences. I would say the sales team is the hardest team to learn to lead by far. And if you're going to scale from around the two to 300 grand a month mark to the a million dollar a month mark, you really need to know how to operate your, be like able to operate the company or have a partner in the company who can be like the, the integrator, so to speak. Like there's a reason there's all these books about that stuff. And so um, the way I would motivate myself to do it is like I know if I can lead a sales team, I can lead any team in the company very, very well. You know, minus like, something I have no idea about, like a dev team or something like that. I would, I would, I would have no, I'd have to bring in a partner, you know? So uh, part of the reason I think we scaled so fast is because I knew how to manage a sales team before I started my company. So then when it came to hiring and building teams, I was already very proficient because I think the sales team is one of the hardest. Uh, I mean, it's just very performance-based. It's very like, it's a great question. Um, it, it's just, you, you have to be really great at coaching people to success, right? Like I think with an operations team, for instance, it's like, did you get it done or not? You know, even with marketing and project-based teams, it's kind of like, did you do it or not? With, with, with sales, it's like, you kind of got to 
coach them through whatever thing they're going through. And then you got to really, it's like you got to be on top of them. And it just, the, the consequences of it not being done very well is pretty high. Oh, you know? Yeah, pretty much. It's only three years old. Yeah, not even. It's like two and a half. With the tracking, do you have your reps enter in their stats manually or do you automate So what them? we do is the, a VA every day has a Slack channel called Closer Stats. They post like a thing that has like schedule calls, live calls, all that stuff. The closers input their data and then the VA manually puts it in the sheet. And then also, because you know, they're gonna forget, right? So then the VA also pesters them if they don't give their stats. Because like the issue is if you have the closers do it and they do it one day, then three or four days goes by. You gotta go back. Well, the issue is three or four days goes by and then you remind them and they finally do it. They always will misremember their numbers. So then your, your data's all messed up. So you gotta have somebody responsible for like getting it every day and then entering it in. Because otherwise it just falls by, the, you know, salesmen love admin, right? So like they, yeah, they just don't do it. So yeah, that's, and then the, the VA too, the operations person, then they also like, they kind of like look at the salesperson's calendar and they look at like their numbers versus other people's numbers and they kind of also call bullshit and see if, they just make sure the salesperson's being honest. But yeah, you have to get some of that data self-reported. Compensate? Yeah, so I mean, there's a lot of different ways to do it. I used to, so now the guys who run mine, they're on profit share. I think that's a great way to do it once you're really committed to the person. I think it's probably the best. Uh, but my guys also do fulfillment. They're kind of like uh, like Jesse was for Sam, you know? So I have one guy for my B2B, one guy for my B2C. Um, but there's different ways you can do it. I think the best way is to pick like a good on-track earnings that you want. And I would say, Generally, like if what you want to do is you want your salesperson or your sorry, your sales manager to make a little bit less at the beginning, but with more upside and also more downside. Because if they make a little bit less, but that they're not on calls, that's a huge win for them. So they're going to feel like the, even though they're making less, they got promoted. All right. So let's just say a little bit less with more upside and more downside is 15K a month. Right. So what I would do is I would pay, and, and, and there, there's a lot of different ways you could do this, right? But let's say you pay half a base, so you pay 7.5K a month. And then what you do is like this. Shit. So this is the projection. And so if they hit, like, because your, your, your team's going to set a projection every month, and, and you're really going to set that, right? And so you want them to get to 15K a month on track earnings, which what's 7.5 divided by five? That would be, can somebody do that real fast? 1. 5. Huh? 1. 5. 7. 5 by 5. Is it 1.5? Yeah. Right. So this is the target. And then it looked like this. So, you know, there's a projection every single month, right? And let's say the projection, just for easy math, is 100 units. Like you're, you're going to do 100 sales this month, and you decide that. If they hit that, they're going to get 7.5 plus 1,500 plus 1,500 plus 1,500. If they exceed the projection and hit 105% of it, which with 100 units would be 105, right? They're going to get the, the extra 1.5. And then if they hit 110, they're going to get the extra 1.5. So this is what I recommend now, or something similar to this. And then you can always increase. Like let's say they do really good, you scale from 250 grand a month to 700 grand a month. Well, you could always increase this on-track earnings and give them a promotion to where now their on-track earnings is like 20. You know, see what I mean? But the reason I like this better than a percentage is because let's say you 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 bring on your sales manager and to kind of get them a compensation that's going to be lucrative, you let's say give them three percent. But then let's also say you go from 300 grand a month to 3 million a month. Now you've got a guy making 70 grand a month. And is he providing 70 grand a month worth of value? I don't know. But a lot of times I have a lot of people come to me and they're like, hey, you know, I paid my sales manager 8% of cash. 
and it was fine when we were doing 150 grand a month or 200 grand a month. But now we're doing a million a month, and he's making an absurd amount of money, and we feel like we're overpaying. So that's the issue with paying cash a lot of times. So what I do, what I did, is I did this. And you can, you can play around with this. But like the, the idea is, the beauty of this is it resets every 30 days. Does that make sense? So that the, earn, the earning potential stays the same, but it keeps resetting. And then you can give them raises at your discretion. You see what I mean? But didn't he help you get the 800 grand like a million a month though? Like what's well, it, 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 it depends. I mean, dude, sometimes it's just not, like, I, yes, I agree. And I, I think you should raise that then. Yeah, like, yeah. if you go from 200 to 800, yeah, I think you should get more. Yeah, yeah. But sometimes when it's like purely tied to the cash, mm. it's not always tied to the value that they're providing. True. You know? And the other thing is too, is if you go from 200 to 800, you might have been at 70% profit at 200, and then at 800, you might be at 30% profit or 35% profit. Mm -hmm. But his income wasn't affected. Mm. See what I mean? So yeah. I like this, and then, yeah, I, I, I don't mind doing a percentage, but I like this until you know, like, okay, this is my long-term, like, and write, write or die share. person, and then I move to the profit share. And what, what, why did you come up with the 1500? Was that just? Well, that's 7.5. So the on-track earnings was 15K. I did a 7.5K base. And then I did the 7.5 divided by 5. Because you have five projections. Or what, what's the four? Is the five coming? So this is 90% of the projection 95, oh. 100, 105, 110. Oh, okay. And so this keeps resetting, you know? And then that way, when you give them a percentage, it doesn't get outlandish. So I would do that for a couple of, weeks, a couple of months. And then, you know, if you really like it, just move to probably Who share. Who calculates all of this stuff? Who's so that? so they, they calculate it themselves, and then they give it to my CFO, and my CFO just checks it. But then what I do is, once I have that down pretty well, I, uh, I just move it to profit share. Is the CFO pretty busy? Uh, probably, I don't know. I'm just thinking how many, when, is there a certain number of setters and closers before like all of this math gets? Well, this is just the sales manager. Yeah, no, but you've got your setters math, you've got your closers yeah, math, so you've got your cash has, collected, you've got your... Yeah, she has a way to do it that is like, re it's really streamlined. Yeah, I'm just thinking when would people need someone to look after their, oh, all of this yeah. math, you know what I mean? Yeah, so it's like a controller position. Because um, this is getting intense at scale. Yeah. yeah. Um, yeah, I mean, I had her from the beginning. I would say, I mean, I don't know. I, I would really look into, you know, if you're doing a couple hundred thousand a month, I would really look into just getting a controller who just does that. Because you definitely don't want to be doing Maybe you should add that to your list, by the way. The controller? Does anyone else want to know about that? Like the financial controller after a few hundred K a month? Because all of this math is intense. I don't know if you want to calculate all of this shit. Yeah, you definitely shouldn't be. So like, what I did, is I had a bookkeeper who was, I mean, this is probably not the, the way I would replicate this, but I had a bookkeeper who was like the second person I like ever hired. And she was just really, really good. And I just kind of like kept asking her like, well, hey, like I can't, I can't do this commission stuff. Like, can you do this? Can you also do this? And then like, I just kind of kept paying her more. And then eventually I was like, well, do you just want to work full time? And now, so then she kind of went to controller and then eventually she's like CFO, which you know, I, I define the differences. CFO, she now has a team, and controller is like, uh, you know, one man band type of deal. That's probably not the accurate definition of how it's supposed to be, but that's how I did it. So yeah. What's the profit share? Like, is it straight up bottom line profit, or so I do it off NOI. Okay. So like, what I do is, uh, it's like off. Um, there's like cash is the top, right? And then like in your expenses. I do labor, oops, ads, and then overhead, right? And so labor is part-time and full-time W-2 and W-9 contractors, right? Ads is ads. And then overhead is like insurance, legal, software, your merchant fees, uh, event expenses, and some other stuff. This tends to always end up being 5 to 6%. Right? So what I do, and then after that is NOI, and then the profit share is based on that number. Right? So the reason I do that is like, let's say I, uh, 
let's say like you know I decided to join a mastermind that was a hundred grand, and you know sure it benefits the company, but it's you know it's kind of for me. That way it doesn't come out of their profit share, and I don't I also don't have to say hey can I buy this mastermind? Are you guys gonna be mad if I buy this mastermind? Or let's say I, w I want to put my rent on my P and L for taxes. You know, or let's say I buy a car and I use it for a photo shoot and I put it on my P and L. Well, like, is that fair to my profit share people? You just give them a few points, or is it just 10, 20 percent. Well, it depends, you know. So, like, I can just tell you what I've done. I have my operations, like my COO, is at three percent profit share, and then my guy who runs my B two B is at six point five, and my guy who runs my B two C is at ten. Now, they do the same exact responsibilities, so why is there such a big difference? Because the, the B2B is just so much more, it's set up to be so much more profitable, and the B2C has so much more ads expense that uh, when I switched all my exec team to profit share, they actually, 6.5 and 10, they, they were making the exact same amount of money, though. I mean, and they're making also like 40 grand a month, so like they were making really, really good money. Now they're making even more, you know? And I'm probably gonna give the B2B guy a raise. So like you just kinda gotta figure out like what's a win for the person and also makes sense for you. So I think for most, for most sales managers though, if you're getting them, um, again, you want it to be kind of a little, at first, a little bit less than they're making as a full-time sales rep with more upside, more downside. You know, so if you got, but so eventually like if they got, a, if you got a bunch of sales reps making 15 grand a month, you, know, you could start them off at let's say kind of a 12 to 13-ish target range and then work them up to like, let's say they're making 20. You know, and you can kind of do that through your, through your uh, profit share or through kind of the commission structure and stuff like that. Does the CSM has the potential of upselling into the mastermind? Do they have a higher earning potential than yes. the sales managers? Yeah. So, well, than the sales manager? Yeah. No, I mean the, the CSM who upsells into the mastermind. I, I don't know. I guess it just depends. Um, it's just kind of two different teams. Like that's the fulfillment team, and then the sales team is the sales team. You know, so I mean, but the C, my like if, if the CSM is doing the upsell, like they they should be making kind of like salesperson money though, if they're doing well. Does that answer your question? So there's like a sales rep can make this much, the sales manager can make this much. Where does the CSM kind of fit in that? Yeah, I mean, if the CSM, so I'll tell you this: for my B two B, my sales guys are making. 25 to 40, uh, they're also really good for the B2B side because we need people who can talk to people like you guys. Like, they can't be like newbies. You know, you're not gonna buy if the person's terrible. You're like, oh, this is not good. You know, this is what the guy does. So he's gotta be really good. And then uh, the, the account managers, they also make about, on average, usually 20 to 30. I got one guy though who's a freaking animal and he does, he's clearing 50. And I have another guy who's, who's all, all, the manager also is clearing like 35. So they're making a little bit less of the sales people, but I kind of view that as like the, the retired sales guy role. You know, it's like after you're kind of done like grinding and starting over at zero every month, you move into this account management role in my company. And that's where like you've learned all the skills, like you really want to teach sales, but opposed to going to compete with me, I just give you a book of business and you just got to keep them paying. So like we just give them clients every month and then they're incentivized to retain, upsell, cross-sell, you know, all this stuff. And does the sales manager for B2B, do they get profit share of even the mastermind if one of the customers goes to that? Yes, but my guy who runs my sales team also does fulfillment, and he, he's like the GM. He does it all. Is that Mitchell? Yes. Yeah, so he does everything. And I have another guy named Brian who does everything for the B2C. And then I only do marketing. And I lead the exec team, that's it. Okay. Yeah. So it's just kind of like, but you know, there's a lot of ways you could do these things, right? There's like no one right way, I can only share what I've done. Uh, but yeah, I mean, like I, I, I kind of didn't follow a template, I just sort of was like, well, like here's the people I have, here's what I want to do, like I think this is what's kind of gonna work for us, you know? What, can you explain like your B2B offer? But... How does that work? Um, and the price well, point? Well, typically it's 18K, they come in, three months, and then they go to uh, like usually 70K if they can qualify for the mastermind. And if they can't qualify, there's like a continuation, which to be honest, I don't even know what the price of that is, but 
as a continuation to work them up into the master plan. On 18K, you place the setters yeah. report, right? Yeah. And it's only 90 days. Yeah. Maybe we'll give them more time if they more time. Could you share a little bit about the last point, which was your business model? Could you share a little bit more about the offer structure? And what specifically? About the B2C as well? B2C? Yeah, so B2C, well, B2C used to be 8,800, and they would get lifetime, group calls, 12 weeks of group coaching, or 12 weeks of one-on-one -on -one coaching, and then we would try to upsell to 15K, which was like a mastermind. The problem with the B2C is you just found nobody had money. It was just like so poor, you know? And so um, we weren't really making a lot of money on the mastermind. It was probably like, I mean, it was like, we were making an absorbent amount on the front end and then just like nothing on the mastermind. Just, it was really, really, really tough to build up any sort of, they just had, these guys had no money was the issue. So then what I decided to do is we, we kind of took the mastermind and then we made that the front end. So now it's 9,800, 12 uh, months. They get 12 weeks of one-on-one -on -one coaching, but the year of group coaching and the year of the school community and all that stuff, and there's 10 group coaching calls a week. Yeah, but I mean, there's 300 people coming in a month, you know. What, what, what would you say is the biggest reason why you have this uh, huge growth and other people don't? What do you think is the main Well, main the, the, thing? The, the biggest reason is that I was a part of a company that went from 300 to a million five and I was like the best salesperson and a huge part of that. I was an integral part of that company. Like by the time I left, I was one of the most senior people at the company. So like there's, you know, it's one thing for you to hear something, hear somebody say something or read something out of a book, but I was able to experience it. And so because of that, I, I, knew, what the, I knew what eight figures looked like. And so when I went on my own, I just was like, oh yeah, I can easily do eight figures. It was just like, I just knew I could do it. And I knew what it looked like. And so like along the road, I was like, oh yes, this is where I need a, uh, like I need, I need, like I would remember like our CFO and our COO and what they did in the company and, I, and how the, the meetings were all structured. I, I remembered all these things from the time I was at TF. And so they kind of had to go through a bunch of trial and error to learn all this stuff. But since I worked for them and I worked through all the, I was there during all of the growth pain, I just kind of knew it, you know? I was like, okay, well, they, we're, we're at the level now where we need a controller. We're at the level now where I need a COO. We're at the level now where, okay, we have this amount of people. We need to create our communication cadence like this. And then also, the other thing that's really, really good about working for a company before you start your own is also when I worked for them, I, I had a huge list of stuff I really didn't like. And then I changed that when I started my own company. So you learn what to do and what not to do. Because like anytime you work for a company, there's always these things you're like, man, I hate it how they really should do this. I hate it how they do that. And so like I kind of saw where they were like not doing as well and like mistakes they made in the future. And so I tried to change that. And then I also modeled what I thought was really helpful. I mean, that's the biggest reason. Second biggest reason is like, you gotta have a good offer and you gotta get something that, that, that scales your lead flow. Because really like everything works off the offer and the marketing and the product obviously, like all that's gotta be really good. And then you think of like sales as fulfillment for marketing. Fulfillment is fulfillment for sales. And then operations, finance, and everything is like fulfillment for everybody else, right? So it's kind of like a, a, a chain effect, you know? So you gotta really have that like explosive good marketing campaign. So I really worked on trying to find that for a long time. It's like, what can I do? I just knew like I need something that's gonna scale on ads really well. So that's why I did the recruiting. Because I was like, I didn't want, really wanna do it. It's a huge pain in the ass. But I was like, well, like I kind of surveyed the market and the only other guy that was in my industry that was running ads was doing recruiting. And everybody was asking me for recruiting. So I was like, well, f I'm going to do it. You know? How did you balance like, the marketing ad spend and uh, the sales team? Was it like 10K ad spend and 20K ad spend and 50K ad spend? Yeah, so what you do is method number one, which still works to this day, is you kind of just eyeball the calendar. And you spend more if the calendar's not full enough. You know, that's kind of method number one. Method number two is you have your sales team set all their projections, and then you kind of like get all the projections, make sure they're not BS, and then you take about 90%, uh, I'd say 80 to 90% of that, and then that becomes the sales manager's projection. And then you take the sales manager's projection, you multiply it by target CPA, and then that's your spend. And then you start, uh, 10 days before the month, ramping into that spend or lowering into that spend. 
Does it make sense? Yeah. 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 That's the way you do it. Because the salespeople, you know, they're going to over project a little bit, right? Even though if they're going to be really, high, they're going to get over project. So we kind of take the sales manager's projection. There's a hedge. And that's the company's projection. And then we target. We we multiply that by our target cost per acquisition. Which, if we're on a push month, if we're trying to grow that month, we'll, we'll add 10 or 15% to that number. If we're just maintaining, or we're actually going to go down, like maybe we cut a bad rep, but we didn't replace them, so we're going to do less units, but it's going to be a more efficient use of energy. Then what we'll do is we'll minus it by 10%. Does it make sense? So, like, you know, are we bulking or are we cutting? Type of deal. What was the first method called? Sorry? What was the first method you mentioned? First wind? Because uh, you said there's two ways. The eyeball, the eyeball method. Oh, yeah. right. Just guessing. Because, because so, so the second way I did it sounds real fancy, right? And you're like, oh, we should do it that way. Here's the pitfall of that. What happens is, is because it's based on 90% uh, of the, uh, and, and you, know, you can also prevent this through just good leadership, but because it's based on technically 90% of the team projection, what happens is sometimes, let's say that the reps or like you have some blips in marketing and the, uh, the calendars are a little bit light. Like they're not fair, but they're not packed to the brim. Well, then the next month, the reps will lower their projection a little bit. And then what happens is then the sales manager lowers their projection. And then you spend a little bit less. And then maybe like this, the same effect happens again. So that the reps, they're trying not to hit, because like we have this culture where you can't miss projections, right? So they're, they're kind of, okay, I'm trying to gonna play a little bit safer. And then the sales manager's projection lowers, and then the spend lowers. And you see how that cycles? And then next, and then what happens is the calendar is gonna bear and bear and bear and bear. So there was a time where like a couple months I had to do a reset, and I had to like, I'd be like, okay, like we just need to spend and just fill the calendars. So you, got, you kinda gotta make sure you eyeball it correctly too, or you're gonna kinda be suspect of that cycle. For you, when you spend so much money on ads, isn't it like every month you have to have something new, 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 to make it like, not always, man. I mean, dude, for for seven months, I literally ran one YouTube ad to one VSL. And then I spent the rest of the year trying to beat it, and I couldn't beat it. Yeah. So, and then I would say for also, like, the, uh, yeah, it's more of, like, it's kind of like producing, like, a hit song, right? So, like, what happens is, like, you, you try a bunch of stuff, and it's like, eh. And then you get, like, one ad and one VSL, and that's, like, the hit. Right? You're like, oh, this works. And then you just ride that as hard as you can. And then you can start to see it like, oh, this thing that, like, no matter what I'm doing, it's just not working like it used to. And then you gotta, you gotta produce a new single. How many variations did you make before that one hit? Five. Five. Yeah, so, so I've seen people do like 30 or 40 ads, 50 ads. Like I talked to the V-Shred guys and like, yeah, we do 200 ads a week. I'm like, okay, that's crazy. My method is more like I try to make really, really good ads and put a lot of time into it and then one, and then and try to get one to work, right? Like, so I do less, but try to make them really good. And then once I find the one that works, I just try to like variate, like make as many variations off that as I can. So like, like what I do now is like, I'll, I'll just, I'll find the one that works and then I'll like, I'll just shoot the same one in a different setting. I'll shoot it off my iPhone. I'll like change the first line. I'll like, I'll just shoot and sometimes I'll just shoot another one with a different camera angle. And then like, when that starts to stop working, now what I'm doing is I'm like taking somebody on my team and I'm like, yo, you just say this, just say the same things, say this in the sad. And so I, I have two team members doing that right now. And so like, I kind of just like keep trying to, you know, I have, the, I have this one piece of copy that works. I'm like trying to just like milk it until I, cause like the worst thing is when you're gonna, you know, go through the whole ads thing. And then if you don't spend a lot of time in it, it's hard to beat the one you did spend a lot of time in. You know, it's, it's tough. So, uh, you yeah, know, this is the worst part. And then, you know, there's all this pressure to like do it and you're just testing, it sucks. Okay. Manager, you huh? Why is the sales manager stuck to When he's promoted the sales manager? Yeah, <laughs> yeah when, when the sales manager is promoted uh, the sales manager, is it still doing some goals? No, no, no. Read, read Mike Weinberg's book, Sales Management Simplified. And he has a chapter called The Fallacy of a Player Coach. He, he explains it really, really well, but it's true. And I read that 
and I read it, and I read it all over the place, and I'd heard it, and I was like, ah, oh, it sounds good, but we're, we're better than, like, you know, that, so we'll just make it work. And no, it didn't work. It was, way, it was really bad. Uh, fallacy of a player coach. It's not the book, that's a chapter. The book is called Sales Management Simplified. That's a good book. So I saw a TikTok from Taylor Welch, and he said he can see other people in the industry that came from them, that blew up. Mm -hmm. And I'm thinking he's talking like you, Ashton, some other guys. Yeah. And he said the reason that people left is because his ego was like too big. Oh yeah. For for you to have stayed there, is there anything that they could have done? Oh, that's a great question. Yeah, I love when I get asked this. Yeah. So what they should have done is I. But my my goal. They had this company called Sales Mentor, right? They just shut down, by the way. They shut down last week. They, so they let go of all their employees. So, uh, you know, it's be some good people for y'all to interview. I know we're, in, we're interviewing a lot of them. But um, they, uh, they had this company called Sales Mentor. They should have, like, I, I was obviously, like, you know, and I don't say this to try to sound like a big ego. Like, I, I have been the most successful person from the group of people that I was with there. So, like, I was very, very talented. They should have identified that and just give, I mean, dude, if they would have given me 10% of the new offer and just let me do it, I mean, I would have built my company for them. No doubt. Because I really liked it. You know, I liked being a part of a team. And I will say, like, when I, when I went from zero, it wasn't until I got about 400 grand a month with a great team of eight people to where I really started to enjoy what I was doing. Before that, it was just pure scarcity and fear. Like, it was like improving them wrong. Like, it was like, I'm gonna prove them wrong. I'm going to like, you know, I'm gonna rub it in, prove them wrong, F them. And I was like, I don't, I don't wanna be broke, right? Like that was the energy. And then when I got a good team, I was like, okay, like I really like the people I'm working with, like this is fun, you know? And like, I think the two most important things you do in your life is like the work that you do and the people you do it with. So when I got a really good team, I was like, okay, like I actually enjoy my work now. And I was like more like towards opposed to away from. But you know, it wasn't until about 400 grand a month was when, when it was. It was November of 2020, 2020, you know? But yeah, to go back, the reason I was telling you that is because that's why I really liked working there is because I liked the people. You know, I lived in there, I worked in the office. So you know, if they would have just given me a piece and been like, dude, we, we trust you, we think you're super talented, like you go create a thing and like you, we'll support you. Uh, yeah, that would have helped. Jay Abraham told me that uh, if he could go back in time, what he would do is whenever his all-stars left and started a new company, he said instead of like getting real mad and like being like, F you, you know? He said he, or suing, suing them. He said he would have just offered to take equity in their company and coach them to success. And he said if he would have done that, he would be tremendously more richer than he was today. Yeah. That was the only nugget I got from the conversation. Yeah. Jay, Jay, Jay's like a rambler, you know? But that one I thought was really good because I was asking him, like, you know, he's the old, old guy, right? I was like, what would you, if you were me, what, would, what do you wish you knew now? And so, like, I've always thought of that, but, like, preemptively what's better than that because I don't want it to come to that, right? I, like, lose my guy, right? So now that's why I have so many, yeah, I just had this hoarding mentality for the longest time, and now I'm much more apt to put people on profit share. I'm like, who else can we put on this? Especially if they're good, because I'm like, oh my god, I don't want to lose this person. Like they're so good, and I like them, you know. Like, and it, it's just more fun to have a good team. Like I think it's the most important part about what you do is just having a really good team that's really fun. You all have the same values. You can depend on each other. You're there for each other. Like, it, it really like I would rather make less money and have that for sure. And I think you'll make more money if you have that. When you said about the research market, you said you surveyed customers to learn about what they want. How, how did you survey to come up with the messaging and offer? When I was researching the market? Yeah. I didn't, I, I didn't survey the customers. I surveyed my competitors. I don't know. I'm just very, I was very aware, right? And I was trying to sell people, and I was listening to what they said on the phone, and I was, like, seeing what posts they responded to. Like, I knew I, I knew that was the recruiting when I made one. It was in June in 2020. I made one post about if you need setters, here, did, hit me up, here's my offer. And I literally did like 160 grand off a post. I was like, okay, like, I was like, I gotta worry about fulfillment. And then I hired 
like somebody would run, I was like, I gotta hire somebody to run the recruiting. And I, like we, we just kind of, what really helped me too is I had an audience of salespeople. So like I was, I knew I had this limited time where I could place people out of my audience. So I was like, I was like using my Facebook group, like yo, like who needs a sales job? And like really good people would reach out to me. And I was just placing them. But I was like, man, this ain't gonna work forever. So I had to figure out how to do the recruiting thing, which is hard. It's like, that was a, like, I, I can tell you this too. Like, for months, I was like, I hated the recruiting so much. I was like, we're not gonna do this. I'm only gonna, do, I'm only doing it right now to make money. I'm not doing it long term. I hate it. It's not scalable. And then we just kept, it just, this thing snowballed out of control. And we just kept getting referrals and word of mouth and referrals. And eventually I was like, I was just so deep in, we just kind of had to like figure it out. And then once I got removed from it and we had a good system and we knew how we could scale, like became predictable. Then I was like, okay, you know, it is what it is. How did you come up with the pricing strategies at the different levels? I just made it up. Yeah, you just, just kind of like feel it out over time. You know, you, you go too high, you're like, oh, that's too high. You go too low, that's too low. Yeah. Um, does Quasi want to do his, his case study? Is he still here? Oh, I bored, I bored him. Uh, anybody, I mean, set or pitfalls, who asked that? It was you? Okay. Yeah, the biggest thing is by far not giving enough leads. That's the biggest thing. Like, you got to give them those benchmarks, I said. Like a lot of times too, somebody will have, they'll be like, man, well, when I was in the DMs, I was setting this amount a day. And now I have three setters and they're setting the same amount I was setting a day. And I'm like, well, how many leads? Are, are the leads any different from when you were setting? And they're like, no. And I'm like, well, that's why. You know, because there's only so much like value or equity or whatever you want to call it within a certain amount of leads. Like there's only going to be a certain amount of sets within those leads. And so you, you, the, the biggest thing is giving them enough leads. <coughs> um, and then using a local dialer, texting, texting the, right when it comes in, speed to lead. How are you texting? It's in the dialer. Oh, OK. Yeah, so it's a, it is like a. So and they're we, typing, and, we, and it's in and the And we computer. automated the, the text. OK. So that the first one goes out, the second one is from the center. What do you use to automate? Allaware. Allaware does broadcast, dialer. Yeah, it, it, it also is kind of a piece. So, like, it's, it, it's a love-hate relationship with them, you know? Starting your dialer. Me? Yeah. I don't know. It just, it just seems like a big project. So somebody else should build one and just give me equity to promote it. Huh? Would you say the, the hole is? The hole? <laughs> the... the did you say there's a there's something that's missing in the market? If they build it, they're gonna blow up. I oh, a dialer. Know. We need. There needs to be a dialer for. Oh, there needs to be a good dialer. Yeah. Yeah. And and very simple. Wouldn't need. They're, they're, all these have too many features. Yeah, I don't even like when I log in. Like, I, I don't even log into that thing. I'm like, ugh. How about like an AI dialer? Like an AI. Yeah, probably probably a ways away from that. Yeah. So I would say local presence, the texting, enough leads. You know, the other thing is just giving your setters some love, man. Like, like train them, you know? Like, I mean, I know that sounds ridiculous, but you know, if you do a call, like just try to do a call review with them every day, right? Or like if they're, if they're only DM setters, you have them do a soundless loom video to where they go through all their, like, you know, it doesn't have to be all their conversations, but a lot of their conversations from the previous day, top to bottom, Soundless, right? So like they're not narrating the convo, which will be like a 20 minute video. It's just kind of like quick, like And that way you can grade their combos, like a call review, but it's a DM review. And then you just, you know, because what happens is when you have setters and closers and you only have one manager, the attention all goes to the closers and the setters just get no love. Enough leads, like what's the minimum, what's the maximum? Is that like right, so it depends on the funnel, right? Group funnel, 400 to 600 group joints per month per setter. Low ticket buyers, 97 or lower, I would say, let's just say 500 per month per setter, right? Opt-ins from a VSL or a webinar, 700 per month per setter. 
And if you've got like a 2K or 1K course, I mean, that's like, I, I've never really tested that, but I would imagine it's probably pretty low. Like you probably have like 20 to 30 per month per setter. Or sorry, uh, 200 to 300 per month per setter. And maybe more. What you want to do is you want to kind of just pick a number and then you give them more, like, okay, this month we're going to give them 10% more. And do you, do you get a correlation with sets? Okay, next month, 10% more, 20% more. Where, where is that? Oh, okay, we, we, we had a round off there. So like, let's kind of dial it back. And you find the sweet spot. It's different for every company, every offer, and every funnel. But those benchmarks relatively are pretty good. Can you assign the lead? Like in the CRM? Or oh, it's, the it's round robin. Okay, we just have it like free for all. Yeah, so we had that too, and I was real big free for all for a while, but it doesn't it doesn't scale. And then the experienced ones always find ways to game the system. Yeah, and so like we had this guy just game in the system somehow. I, I don't I still don't know how he was doing it. And when we moved it to round robin, he he went to zero, man. Like he literally just couldn't do it. It was very weird. So like yeah, I would do round robin from the very beginning um, because it you know it just. At scale too, it's just very hard like for like the experienced people, like what you get is the experienced people finding a way to game the system and like let's say wake up in the morning and text every single lead that came in from, from for the last eight hours. So they take all the leads. And then like the newer people can never get their footing and so you have high setter churn on the newer people. It wasn't the end of the world. Like we had six setters free for all and I mean we were doing over, you know, couple million a month right so like it's not like it didn't work but we eventually switched it and it was a much much better idea well, I have a bit, little bit off topic question. what would happen to your business if you run no ads from today like next month after next month how much money would you make no ads well the b2c we wouldn't make really anything because that's all ads driven right i mean maybe not anything but we'd probably make like a hundred <laughs> well i don't know are we taking into account email list yeah, I don't know. I mean, that's hard to say if you take it. With, with email, I would say maybe with the B2C, make a couple hundred thousand a month, but it'd be tough, right? Like, it's just not a, it's a very direct response-y offer. For the B2B, I get tons of, like, referrals and organic and word of mouth. So, like, that would still do a couple hundred thousand. So that's fuel majority. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, for the B2B, we have a lot of, a lot of organic, a lot of referrals, a lot of stuff like that. One thing that's really good is, is we KPI as well our CSMs on referrals. And so we get a lot of referrals from the CSMs working the clients for referrals. And that's very, very good. You know, like, extra or not? Huh? The CSM <coughs> produces a referral that turns into a call. Yeah, they get, they get a setting commission. Yeah. So, so that's a good little method there to like self-propagate your existing base, right? Because, um, yeah, if you can get a lot of referrals, it makes a huge difference. Like our B2B gets a lot of referrals, our B2C doesn't get any referrals. And so, and you can feel it. It's just like there's so much more like padding in terms of profitability with the B2B. Because people talk about it, it's easy for them to, you know, just, yeah, it just travels easier word of mouth. Um, you just mentioned they're gaming it, like guys getting up in the morning and smashing the list and taking yeah. everything. So say you have a uh, thousand opt-ins a day roughly or something. Are you, are you delegating them out to each setter individually or are you giving them a master list of last? Like no, are they owning like, their leads? Or are if, they, if the opt-ins are coming in, the, the whatever, automation, just round robins them. So when it, but when it, when it round robins them, it, they own it. It's like, Joe, that's yours. Sally can't call it. Yes. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Unless they quit. Because that's a big indicator as well, right? It's like you got the same amount of leads. Yeah. Yeah. There's certain systems. We did try something one time where if they didn't call the lead within 10 minutes, they lose the lead. And it just it delegates them to somebody else. Yeah. But yeah, there was a reason we stopped in, you know, I don't know. I just forgot. I mean, it could be a good idea. Yeah, it could be a yeah, could be a good idea. Huh? Through Zapier, opt-in, uh, and then a zap? It's some sort of Zapier, HubSpot, okay. Alloware thing. You know, <laughs> I, 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 don't, I don't mess with any of that stuff. Like, I, I'm, like, more of the up here guy. Like, that stuff's hard for me. Is there a price in the industry? Like, 5K, 
a just in general? Area. Just in general? Yeah, just in general. <clears throat> yeah, I mean, like, okay, so like, I'll, I'll walk through a few things. Health and fitness, the best guys are all selling five to seven K. So if you have a B2C health and fitness offer and you can get it between five to seven K, like I got a guy doing a million a month, cash, 60% profit, and it's all women 40 to 60, $7,800 fitness offer. Wow. Just rip it, yeah. Uh, relationships, kind of same thing, is if you can get it like in the four to six K, it, it makes a world of a difference, right? Obviously it's hard, but like it makes a world of a difference if you can find a way to sort of sell at that price point. Even if you got a kind of a, you know, maybe use funding or financing company or some, something like that to where you can just get, it just helps with ads and, and cash. Uh, with anything biz op, I see anything from 4,800 to 7,800 usually work. How much? 48 to 7,800. But I would also say that like, what we're striving for is 9,800, which is tough. But if they use financing and it's a year long program, it's much, much better because they, they typically pay their financing payments. So there's not as much worry about them defaulting and you get paid up front. When you say financing company, like, do you have to, like, like a high risk, like merchant? Person? No, that's a merchant. Right? Oh, that's a merchant. That right. Like, yeah, financing. Yeah, so, so like one of my friends does six million a month. And what he does is really interesting is an Airbnb offer. And so what he does is they, um, it's all setters. They don't have any inbound all setters and um, they use my setter thing they went through our thing and so it's all setters setters call them set them they have the closer the closer pitches it with the funding right so like the closer is like yeah it's only a thousand dollar down payment and then x amount of dollars a, uh, they give them a range it's like three to five hundred a month depending on what you qualify for financing wise blah, 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 blah. and uh then they they, they take the thousand then they move them off to a different position called a finisher and then the finisher, and that's a live transfer. And then the finisher basically tries to get them in one of the funding options. And then they get paid up front 9,800 and then the clients on you know, whatever term. So we're, we're testing that model now because our biggest thing with our B2C has been uh, getting, like, like we could sell, like people want to do it. It's not that they want to do it, it's they have no money. And, I, and, and it's not like, a, oh, the salesperson's saying they have no money, but they're not good at closing. It's like, no, like, they literally are like, here's a screenshot of my bank account, no money. You know? Like, they have no money. And so that's the biggest challenge of B2C. Like, it's easy to get leads, right? It's easy to make them want to do it. And, you know, for the most part, they're decent clients. Like, it's, it's all that's fine. It's just, that's the obstacle. And so, like, we've been doing a lot of, like, four pays and five pays, and then it creates, creates massive operational complexity and just they don't pay, right? Or they run out of money. So like the idea is that financing hopefully helps, you know, and then, yeah. So like the, we're, we're, we're gonna try that model and see if that helps us. The finance company take the risk. Huh? The finance will take the risk on board. Do, they, do the financing company take the risk? So like as in, they'll obviously get, get paid for it. Do they take the risk if they don't pay after say month six or whatever? Yeah. No, they don't recourse if that's what you're asking. Like no. bad debt, they'll take the bad debt. Yeah. That's, that's how their fees are structured. So what we're doing, I get a little wary about putting somebody on a, th a three-year loan or something. I get a little wary about that. So what I'm, that's why I elongated the program to 12 months, and we're gonna focus on just a 12-month financing term. So that way they're getting value all the way throughout the payments. Does that make sense? Yeah, like in maybe 18 months tops, I'm not gonna do two years or more. Like I'm not gonna do any of that because I just feel like you know they left the program, they're still paying. Like it just wor it worries me. I think you could have an angry mob build up that way. But like if, if, if it's like, if it's the equivalent of a 12 pay for a 12 month mastermind, but I'm getting paid all up front, everybody wins. And I'm more than willing to pay the financing company their fees to do that. It depends on the option, right? And their credit score. So like one of the one we use is like 10% or 11%, but then if the more subprime you get, the worse it gets, right? To the point where it's not even worth it. You read that, you don't have to pass it on to the client. Well, you could, yeah. What about, you said uh, the offers. What do you see like crushing it B2B? Yeah, I mean, our offer's doing good. What else is doing good? It, you know, it just, it, it depends on what industry. Um, in coaching consulting. In coaching consulting? 
TikTok, I mean, it, it's, it's the same stuff. Like all the stuff you guys wanted to learn yesterday is what's working. Done for you agency, do you have some examples? Done for you agency? Oh, a price like, point too. Well, right now, like TikTok ads is really big. YouTube ads is still really big. But I mean like to price wise, do you have some clients who are selling? Yeah, I mean, I would say, uh, I don't know. I would ask Brian Mankata what his. Do you outsource all the leads? Yeah, not do it internally. Everything's internal, yeah. Yeah. So you guys want to go over? Oh, paying fools. Yeah. I have a question about uh, KPIs. What's yeah. the? Um, so let's say, you know, you get a, a you know, a, a thousand opt-ins a day. Out of how many of those pick up? Out of how many of those set? I don't know if you covered that. Yeah, yeah. I, I may not remember this off the top of my head, but I want to say answers is fifteen to twenty percent. Yes, and that's like, it's like a, that's that's calculated not like answers per dial, it's answers per lead, right? Because that's factoring, and you might call somebody multiple times. So the answers I think is fifteen to fifteen to twenty percent typically. If you, especially if you have a local presence. And then uh, out of the answers, I would say, I'm trying to think of, so here's how I know how to calculate this. And this will give you the same stuff. You'll just have to do the formulas different. Out of sets, right now, I know we're at about 11% lead to set. And that's a little bit low. We've been as high as 20%. Set? Yes. Opt-in to set is 11%. So, so lead to answer, 15 to 20%. Lead to set, right now we're at about 11. But we've, our best month in March, I know we were like 20.5%. But our lead flow was really low, so we like squeezed everything out of that lead flow. Yeah. Follow up to the question, For a different, I guess, niches. So you said 4,800 to 7,200 for the make money online niche, right? Right. So if a company who's in that niche wants to reach a million dollars per month, what does the company structure look like? Assuming that they're running a BSL funnel and it's setting up calls, like how many sales reps, how many setters uh, for them to generate a million per month? Well, here, here's the easy, easiest way to think about it, right? If you, if you, if you, um, yeah. So like, if your program was 10K, and you had four closers, four setters, each closer did 20 units a month, that's 800 grand a month, your mastermind would easily tip you over a million right. a month, right? And you could honestly probably do it with three and three with the mastermind if the mastermind was really pumping along. So like, I kinda, you kinda gotta think about it that way. We always think about like for us, each closer does about 25 units. So 25, you know, so each closer is probably gonna do about 200 to 250 grand a month of rev. So we can kinda just like think about it that way. But if your price point is half of that, like 5K, then does that mean you Yeah, you just gotta adjust it. Yeah, but if your price point's 5K, I would at least go to 5,800. Because I, I, I typically never see any change when people increase it to that 800. And so, give that a shot. And then, um, I would even try to get it 68 to 78. And then if you can get the financing going, you know, that's where I see more of those higher ones too. I, I don't like over 10K. I heard somewhere some from somebody after you get past 10K, you get a little bit more risky in terms of like FTC and all of that stuff. So with your 10K plus financing offer, what's like the closing percentage on the phone? So live call to close, like 32, 33. Wow. So it's answer to close, yeah. That's a team wide. So we have some people who are probably below that. We have some people who are like crazy and like they're in the 40s. Yeah. Company recommendation? Company recommendation? Fund my contract is where I would start. What is that? Fund my contract. Yeah, we try to get them on fund my contract, and if not, coach financing. Well, just a clarifying question you said about setters. When you start, you hire two setters, and then get them on a 60-day ramp up, and then I missed the, the last part with that. Two, oh, two setters. The first week is the drink from the fire hose. The second week is half volume, and the third week is, is go. Oh yes, for setters, true. For setters, first week fire hose. Second week, we just let them go, right? See what they do. And we usually want to at least see 10 sets in the second week. 
Yeah. That's us. If, if, if it's like your first set or you're ever hiring, you know, maybe five to seven sets. Yeah. And then after that, you want them within KPI. And you said hire two and then give them a 60 day period. Oh, yeah. Then... So if it's the first time you're ever hiring setters and you're kind of like, hey, we're trying to figure this out on the fly type of deal, instead of having them 100% commission or very close to 100% commission, have them on a draw, which is in other words, it's like, you have them on 60 days of a base to where they make the base. If not, their commissions exceed the base, right? So like a 4K a month draw, if you make 3,000 in commissions, you just make 4K. But if you make 7,000 in commissions, you make 7,000. Mm -hmm. So another follow-up question is going back to what you said earlier. So right now we have a 10% opt-in to the schedule, right? Yeah. And you said it's 11%. Would, should we expect an additional 11% or would it be the total opt-in to Oh, the numbers I gave you was, was just for the setters. So that's not counting our uh, whole system. So if we're getting 10%, we should be expecting an additional 11%? That, that's what I would imagine. There is going to be some cannibalization, yeah. but I have found that like it is relatively separate. But our, Does sorry. that make sense? Yeah. If, if, you, if you want, I, I, don't, I don't know it off the top of my head, but I could screenshot you another time. Uh, the numbers of the total system with the call funnel of like how many, dude, like we've had, I think the highest month, we booked 34% of leads in the calls. Like literally 34%, which is pretty crazy. You said you're at 30 or 40? I'd say around 40 of that. 30. Yeah. yeah, like we've had up up there, right? And, and that doesn't mean we took all of them. We canceled a lot of them, right? But, uh, but we're, yeah. we're, we're talking about, you're talking about calling opt-ins lead speed to lead right like as fast as possible right yes so for example this person opts in at three o'clock and they're going through the funnel and maybe they're like on the first minute of the vsl or maybe they're filling out the survey or something no we call them yeah yeah, so, yeah but they, maybe they're gonna have a better chance of booking if they talk to a human than an automated video yeah yes so let's say they go through it and let's say the speed to lead is a bit slow and they've already opted they've gone through they filled out the survey they came on calendar already and well, we'll they, get a, they get a tag and then taken out of the sequence. Ah. Yeah, so our, our, our setters never call people who uh, have booked. Right, so you want to segment those. Okay. And your CRM, you can have that where it, when they go to call them, well, we use flows, there's hey, Aaron, an opportunity, right? Feel yeah. free. Yeah. Feel free. So they, they don't call the opportunity. Uh, yes. Are you looking also for your people from the front end? Only front end, and then what I recommend is having a dedicated back end salesperson, right? Uh, you guys want to cover the script? Yeah. It's pretty easy. So here's what's very key, and this, this applies with uh, messaging and outbound calls, right? You have to know if you're in an intent-based situation or a non-intent-based situation, right? So what's an intent-based? If you guys see my, fu my funnel where I'm like, our setters perform or you don't pay, that's, that, that's a direct offer. That's an intent-based situation. They've raised their hand, they say, I wanna learn about the offer. Non-intent-based is where they opted in for a free training and now you're just calling them. So you see how those are different contexts? Mm -hmm. You need to approach it in different ways, right? So let me do the feel free real fast. What is that? It's, uh, it's, it's, <laughs> it's, a, it's like a nootropic. Yeah, okay. Makes you feel good. Um, so in an intent-based situation, you say, John, hey, John, just Cole here from Closes I.O., Cole Gordon's company. Yeah, hey, just wanted to call you. Uh, I saw you set it, or I saw you opted in to learn about the fully uh, done for you set of recruitment offer that's fully percent guaranteed. Did you find the uh, hires in terms of setters you were looking for, or are you still looking? Okay, so let me repeat that. I'm like lightheaded because I've been talking so much. but. It's basically, and a little bit, it's kind of Jordan Belfort in the beginning, and then I, I change it. So, John, hey John, just Cole here from Closes I.O., Cole Gordon's company. Hey, saw you opted in to learn a little bit more about our offer, about uh, placing setters or closers into your company that are 100% uh, guaranteed. Did you find the salespeople you were looking for, or are you still looking? Okay, so uh, that phrase, that sentence, some of you guys might know it from Jeremy Miner. It, that was that sales technique was developed by a guy named Michael Oliver. He's a super old school guy. Basically, it's John upward inflection. John just, you know, it's just name, 
from company. So it's like just name from Closures I O, Cole Gordon's company. Hey, and so I, I do that hey, which buys me time, and there's a split second. Hey, pause, saw you, and then I state the action that they did, and then I say, do you, do you, did you find the blank you were looking for, or are you still looking? Does that make sense? Did everybody pick that? Yeah, that's kind of fun. Okay, so that is, it's very easy when it's an intent-based situation. Okay, it's very, very easy. All right, so um, after that, they said, oh, I'm still looking. And a lot of times they'll say, yeah, I saw the ad, or whatever. But they say, I'm still looking. Cool. Um, just so I can get you the information you were looking for, um, I, I'd, love to a little bit, I'd love to know a little bit more about like, what kind of prompted you to reach out and respond to the ad in the first place. So was there, was there something that stuck out about what you saw that prompted you to you know, reach out and put in your information? OK, tell me more about that. We get to talk a little bit. And then you set a frame, OK? Because they're going to try to turn it around. They're going to learn about this, what, it, what this is. I saw the offer. Cool. So everything we do is all customized. You know, like we've recruited for Agora Financial. They're a $1.5 billion company. We've, we've done it for people who are just starting off. So a lot of it depends on, on kind of where you're at and what you're looking for. And you know, given that I don't know anything about your business right now, I think at this stage, what's probably going to make the most sense is let me understand a little bit more about your company, your acquisition system, kind of what you're doing. And then based on that, I'll share with you the information that's relevant and useful to your company specifically. Is that fair? OK, perfect. And then we go into uh, like a little bit of discovery. What's your offer? How are you selling it? You know, all, all that stuff, right? If we know kind of what the pain is, OK, they're looking for setters. Then we want to find out background, right? So it's like, what are you, what's your offer? How are you selling it? What are you selling? I need to know like context of the company. And then if they're looking for setters, I know they want appointments. So I'm going to go, so, so the biggest challenge is you know, your lead generation right now. Then once I understand the biggest challenge, and it's how are you currently trying to solve that challenge? So I'll ask that in the form of, well, how are you tr currently trying to generate leads? OK, let's see how that's working. How many leads did you generate last month? And then like, OK, out of those, how many were qualified? How many did you close? At what price point? So it's just kind of that type of stuff. And then, so that's the initial part. I think, I, think I, I think you guys get the intro. You guys get the rest. You want a very, think of your sales call. You want a very light version of that. And uh, it's like a lighter version for the, for the setter call. Now, for a non-intent-based situation, it's a little bit different because they did not say they wanted to hear about your offer, but they did say that you do have their information, right? So what you do here is you say, let me kind of, I just want to make sure I have it right. So I'll use one for, I, I did for Grant Cardone. So it's like, uh, John, John, just Cole here from uh, Cardone Ventures, Grant Cardone's company. Hey, saw you entered your information about the Breakthrough Point quiz in terms of the constraints of your business. Did you find the actual results of the quiz? Or were you, know, were you able to find that? Do you need any help finding that? Oh, I was able to find it. OK, cool. Awesome. Well, Brandon wanted me to reach out. In addition to helping you with your results, also be able to pair you up with a free training based on what you need help with in your business. Um, you know, we've done tens of thousands of hours of training over the years. So opposed to kind of like send you a copy and paste one size fits all training, we wanted to give you something that's like very pointed and relevant to exactly what you need in your business right now. So has anybody on the team reached out to you about this yet? They say no. Cool. Do you have like two or three minutes so I can hook you up? OK, great. Well, like I said, we have like tens of hours of stuff, and I want to give you something that's relevant to you. So like, what would you say is, I guess, your biggest challenge in the business right now? And then based on that, I can hook you up with something that's relevant and useful for you. So that's the basics. I'm kind of going through it pretty quickly. But that's the basics. So you, you, you reach out, John, uh, John, just Cole here from Grant Cardone's company, calling about the blank you entered your information about. Were you able to receive that in your email? So you take a customer service frame in the beginning. And then you say, hey, we also wanted to reach out to give you a free gift. Has anybody reached out to you about this yet? No. OK, great. Well, we have tons of stuff. So opposed to giving you a one size fits all, he wanted us to personally reach out and give you something that's actually relevant and useful to what you're doing in business specifically. So do you have five minutes so I can pair you up with that? OK, cool. Well, what would you say is your biggest challenge right now? And then based on that, I can give you something that's relevant and useful for you. So you see how I kind of use it. I use the free training as a hook to sort of be able to get permission to ask questions about their business. 
Does it make sense? So that, that framework right there is what I developed for traffic and funnels, and, and that's what built their outbound team. So we would call the memos people, and we'd say, hey, you know, Taylor wanted us to reach out to your memo subscriber and give you a free training. Uh, we have, you know, thousands of hours worth of stuff. So I guess, like, what would you say is your biggest challenge in your business right now? And then based on that, I can pair you up with something that's relevant and useful for you. So, like, I literally just sat there one day um, dialing people with the way of the wolf open and was like, what do I say to these people? And I just, I ended up falling on that script because it was very similar to what I was saying in the DMs. And I was like doing the whole two-step thing and I knew the DMs were working. So those are the two scripts. Does that make sense? But the call, yeah, yeah. Huh? In the script you're offering them, I'll send you this info. How do you then Right, so what you do is you go, you go through the triage, which is like you, you figure out their pain, what they're, what they're currently trying to do to fix the pain, um, how long have they been doing that for? You know, what's been keeping them from doing that, you know, on their own, like what's in the way? Ultimately, what's the goal? You just really want to figure out like the very basics on the triage. It can be like a five minute discovery, very light. And then you say, okay, great. Well, look, I'm going to send you that training. And while it's definitely good, it's not going to be the magic bullet to be able to get you to a million a month in your business by like next Wednesday. Okay. So look, independent, if you want to work deeper with our team or not, I can pair you up with one of our lead advisors, so-and-so. He works closely with the clients, and he'll be able to share with you some of the frameworks that other people, other women have used to be able to solve the relationship issues and be able to find the man that they've been wanting without having to X, Y, and Z. And then, of course, if you're interested in the, whatever the product's called, if you're interested in working deeper with Anna, they can tell you a little bit about that as well. Cool? So anyways, I have their calendar open now. When works either this date or this date to be able to book in? One other thing that we tested, I should tell you guys, everybody, everybody was saying they had a lot of no-shows. Essentially, one of the things we tested and got a big lift in our setter show rate was a cancellation fee. So here's how, it's, it's basically along the lines of, uh, so I do the whole thing, I'm like, does this date or this date work? Okay, does this time or this time on this date? Cool, what's your email? Okay, I just sent you an invite right now. Will you accept that? They have a crazy assistant. If I don't, they don't set this, it's gonna take, take it off the calendar. Okay, great, so you accepted that, perfect. And one last thing, we do have a $100 cancellation fee. So are you 100% gonna be able to make that time or is there any chance you gotta reschedule? I just wanna make sure that's not gonna be an issue. Yeah, $100 cancellation fee. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> they don't pay anything. Huh? They don't pay anything for them. No. You just mentioned it. <laughs> we, we, we heard somebody else doing it and their show rate was better than ours, so I was like, guys, we're doing that. <laughs> and it worked. <laughs> No, nobody says anything. Oh, I'll be able to make it. <laughs> oh, good to know. Thank you. <laughs> no, I don't care about that. I just want them to show up. I honestly don't even care if they buy. It's like, just show up, you know? Like, please, please show up. You're ruining my calendar. Yeah, that was a good tactic I learned this, this year. Um, so... That was the script. I, I ran through that pretty quickly, but did that make sense? Obviously, the tonality, you know, I'm like, I'm talking to myself up here. It doesn't probably sound that good, but I think you guys get the point. You just got to identify direct or indirect situation or intent-based or non-intent-based situation. And to be honest, the Messenger DM script you use in Facebook Messenger is very, very similar. So on Facebook, if they select yes, they want to hear about the offer when they join the group, you say, hey, saw you did this. Did you find the people you were looking for? Are you still looking? Did you find the lead gen, lead gen you were uh, looking, did you find the information you were looking for or are you still looking? Oh, I'd love more information. Okay, boom, done. It's, it's direct is super easy. It's like bada bing, bada boom. Um, indirect is a little bit more long form because you got to turn non-intent and then you got to create intent. Does it make sense? Yeah. So, um, Does it make sense to have Yeah, so, so, so like in, in the group, what I did is I would do mostly non-intent based content like uh, value with a soft CTA at the end, some sort of value soft CTA. Then once every week or once every other week, do a post that's like the good old John Carlton. Here's what it is. Here's what it'll do for you. Here's what to do next. Like very like re read if you want result. Like then it's like the offer. And then you just, and then you just delete it afterwards. 
But that thing, I'm telling you, a direct post like that just rips, it, it crushes. Like when I t told you guys about the one post I did that was 160 grand off a post, it was that post. It just said, read if you need setters. And I said, we got an influx of setters who are blank, blank, and blank. If you don't know what setters are, they'll benefit, 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 CTA. Literally just ripped it. So I mean, if you guys want to follow, follow that uh, formula, it's going to work well for you guys. Cool? Yeah, so I can go through that script too if you want. So we're, we're in the process of building our outbound team. And uh, with that, what we do is we use Facebook groups. And we basically find interest-based Facebook groups. And then we find people in our market. And then we punch in their, their data to Seamless.ai. Then we get the baseline data. Then we uh, punch it back into Cognizant. Then we punch it back into this other software called Lucia. So we complete the data set with name, email, phone number, LinkedIn, and whatever else, Instagram, all that stuff. We'll get multiple emails, multiple phone numbers. Then we'll clean it uh, through Neverbounce or Clear All Phone Out, whatever it is. And then we'll upload it to uh, Mailshake and clean it again. And then it goes into a cold email campaign. And then we also dial. So then the dial is, uh, dude, I, it's been so long since I've ta taught this. It's, uh, I'm just gonna, I'm just gonna start talking and maybe I'll remember it. It's John, hey John, just Cole here from Closers.io. Look, uh, calling a bit out of the blue, but give me 30 seconds, I'll tell you why I'm calling, and then after that you can tell me if you wanna uh, keep talking or not. Fair enough? It's that, right? So that one, this is like the, the, the good old cold one, right? And then um, after that I say, are you familiar with brands like, and then I name drop our real famous clients. Right? Are you familiar with brands like Tony Robbins, Grant Cardone, Agora Financial, Frank Kern, people like Dean Graciosi, people like that? So like we help, and then I go into the we help statement. So we help people like that, so coaches, consultants, and agencies, and typically people like that reach out to us when they want to help with one or two things. And then we go problem one, problem two. And then I say, which one of those resonates with you most specifically? Yeah. So that's what I say. He, he'd probably be better though. He was the top person for Salesforce, so I'd ask him about cold calling too. Yeah, re you hand raise. But that, we found that works. If it's in good tonality, we find they're just like, oh, you got to realize, man, nobody's, have you ever been cold called by a really, 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 really good salesperson? No, you haven't, you know? So like, when you, when you are able to call, and even though it, that is a very Sandler-ish based script, if you're able to call and it's just smooth and you're good and you sound legit and like you sound like you have good information and you can help, people are like, yeah, I'm just going to see what this is all about. You know? And then now you're in a conversation. So it does work. That's the key. Be yeah. relevant to their role. Yeah, so it's 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 John, hey John, just Cole here from Closers IO. Look, calling a bit out of the blue, but give me thirty seconds, I'll tell you why I'm calling, and you can decide if we want to keep talking after that. Is that fair? Okay, cool. So you're probably familiar with brands like, you know, Tony Robbins, Dean Graciosi, Frank Kern, Agora Financial, Grant Carno, people like that. So those people, you know, they're clients, people like that, coaches could, and you state, coaches, consultants, agencies, reach out to us, typically for one or two reasons. Either number one, they problem number one, or number two, they problem or desire number two. Now, just curious, which one of those two resonates with you most specifically? Okay, tell me more about that. Okay, gotcha, that makes sense, John. I, I think I have a little bit of insight for you, and maybe I can send you a good resource on that. Can you give me another two to three minutes? Okay, perfect. And then now you're really in discovery, right? So there's two frames, right? There's, it's a little bit trickier. You got to be good. But yeah, we're building out that team right now. And our goal is to master that and then teach that. Because ever since Alex Hormozzi exited with uh, doing the outbound thing, everybody, I mean, dude, if I make a post about that, it's like swarms. For whatever reason, people want to know how to do cold outbound with no ads. Like, and, and no, like, not the setters we're talking about, like, pure cold outbound. And it is nice. I will tell you, like, we're doing 200 to $300,000 a month with it. And it's like, I don't need any ads. And if I, if I die, like, that's going to still, they're still going to be able to do that, you know? Because there's no creatives, no nothing. What was the software you said after Seamless AI? You said Cognizant and Lucia. So, like, we use all these databases to try to complete the data set.
Can you say about body of yourselves last month? They come to people for the PSL session and call on the call and close the rank. I just want to ask, do you also say at the end, like, for those who don't show that they are going to die in isolation? Should we uh, is that only with the set of. So we tried it on the paid ads, and, and, the, sh and the, the booking rate dropped so dramatically that we decided to just take it off. And the show rate didn't improve for that. For setters, it improved. Yeah, all right, cool. Yeah, but good question. We did test that. Uh, okay, cool. So what do you guys want to talk about out of this? Paying fools? Cool. Yeah, quick, quick question. You said before the highest opt-in to appointment ratio you ever had was like 30-something percent. Were, were those approved appointments, or was it before cancellation? That was just like total. It was like in the hot. It might have been like 38. It was like a lot. Okay. But, but where it was actually approved? Because you said like you were canceling a lot of appointments. No, that was just like total bookings. Got it. So after, right. after that, some were canceled, then you were Yeah, some were around. canceled, some were this, some were that, yeah. Okay. So probably approved appointments were around 20, 20 something, probably, right? I, I don't know. Okay. Yeah, but what, one thing I'll say though is our setters, the close rate off those calls is much, much higher than the ads calls, and the show rate is higher. So that, that's the other reason I, I like the setters a lot. Thanks. Cool. Most of our traffic is from ads to VSL. Right. So the setter would be, we will implement the setter. The setter will be, call, will be calling those. They're just only calling the opt-ins. Like your ads still go right to the closer. Seeing the setter close is better Which one out of these is most interesting? Painfuls. Painfuls? Yeah, so here's how you get all the pain fools. Um, let's say your price is 10K. Right at the end, you say the investment's 10K, right? And then you, you don't talk, right? And then so what happens is, let's say they say it's a money objection. They're like, well, like, can you break it up? Or like, how does it work? You know, whatever they say. And you say, gotcha, well, um, yeah, we can definitely talk about that. Um, but like, first, let's answer the most important question like, how do you feel? Do you feel like what we covered, the four things in which we covered and which we're going to work together on, is what you need to be able to get to result? Right? And then they say, yes, no, whatever. Then you say after that, gotcha. So money aside, you're 100% in. OK, so let me just break that all down. Step number one, they, get, they ask you a question. What, that's called pacing the first objection, which is a term I just literally made up. So you say, we can. We can definitely talk about that. But first, let's answer the most important question. Um, or, or first, just like, so I can stay organized on my end, how do you feel? Do you feel like process to achieve desired outcome? They say yes or no, right? If they say yes, you double tie down. So objection aside, you're 100% in. So money aside, you're 100% in, OK? Now, on that first question, on both of those responses, what you're looking for is a response with certainty. So you don't want to say, I think so, right? Like, that, that's, that's, I'm going to call that out and be like, I think so. Like, what, what's really going on? You know? You want to hear, like, absolutely. OK? So we get the double tie down. And we got to isolate it to just money. Then we say, well, look, most of my clients do it up front. But for certain clients, depending on their situation, we sometimes allow to break it up, but it's really all customized depending on what your needs. So would you be open to having an honest conversation financially, getting everything out on the table, so we can see if this would be the right fit for you, or if there's a way we can make this work with payments, or at the very least, we can let you leave and come back with a game plan to move forward later. Are you open to that? OK, cool. So how much net cash flow do you have coming in in the next 30 days? They say whatever. Gotcha. And what's your cash on hand exactly right now? Gotcha. And what about credit? Right? So we get, the, we get those things. So let me break that part down. Right? So we get tie down number, so tie down number one, how do you feel? Tie down number two, objection aside, are you 100% in? Then we go permission. Once we have the isolated objection, hey, most of our clients, so we're painting a, we're painting a picture of what most people do in this situation. Right? That's very classic Cialdini. Most people do it up front. But for certain clients, depending on their situation, we allow them to break it up. So would you be open to having an honest conversation financially, getting everything on the table, so we can see if there's a way we can make this work, or at the very least, give you a game plan to work towards this in the future? 
Okay, so we're getting permission essentially for them to tell us how much is in their bank account. Then we, we ask the first question, which is net cash flow in 30 days. That's just to kind of get the conversation rolling a little bit. Then we ask, what's your cash on hand right now? Exactly, which is the, which is the that's what we want. And then once we have exactly how much money they have, then we say, and you really want to do this, right? And they say, yeah, I really want to do this. Right, because we kind of just, you know, they kind of got naked for us there for a second. So we just we need to make sure like they're, they're coming back in. And you really want to do this, right? I really want to do this. Cool. Because I don't think the best thing for you if you only have X, Y, and Z is to do a pay in full and literally drain your bank account to you know $1,000. I also don't think the best thing for you based on you telling me X, based on you telling me Y, based on you telling me Z, is for you to do nothing. So what I'll allow you to do is come in for half down. That way you can come in, work on your lead generation, launch your new offer, collect this and that, do this and that. And then that way, when that second payment comes around, it's basically an afterthought. So if I'm willing to do that for you, are you willing to move forward right now? So I'll, I just taught you how to do a two pay, right? However, what happens though, is that when you get the cash on hand and the credit, if they can pay in full, then you just gotta help, help hold them accountable to paying in full. Does that make sense? That's the key. Yeah, this is super cool. Yeah, so if, if, you're like, hold, if you're like, dude, I didn't write any of that down, the very first YouTube video on my channel is uh, it's called like Financial Objections, and I, I, I break it down, I give you like a Google Doc, and like, it, it, the, the script is literally on my channel. First video? It's, uh, three yeah, it, it's called Financial Objections. It's like, you, you can kind of see when I started. It's the first video when I started. But that works really well. I just, I used to close everybody with that language. Everybody. I would close literally everybody. Not, not physically everybody, but like anybody I would close, I would close in that language. I had a question of Louis Vuitton. You know, you, you know Oscar Moser, right? Sure. He runs ads, but he runs ads very differently than we do. Because he runs it to an opt-in page about some kind of stuff, and then it's immediately an application page. What do you think about that? What do you yeah, I think it's worse. You think it's worse? Yeah. But you know it's different, right? It's like super yeah. Yeah, but just because he doesn't he does it doesn't mean it's better, you know. What do you think about his sales? Uh, yeah, I, th I think what I think what his thing is is that he had such a good offer with these gyms and a good guarantee that it was like basically you make your money and you don't like like he, with, with them because like a lot of us can't do this because our clients are online like business clients like you can't have a coach do the same funnel with the same ads with the same offer with the same guarantee with the same terms all around, I mean, we'd all be doing the same thing, right? But with gyms, you can't do that. So it's just like they install that system and then they're able to generate so much money so quickly that he just kind of makes it like a super crazy, easy guarantee, I think. But for a gym, the clients also pay the month to month or up front everything? It was like a weekly thing, yeah. That's what we do. Yeah. I charge 20% more over three Yeah, I don't do that because I don't want to, because that creates a decision, right? I don't add interest to the payment plans because I go for the pay in full and then the, the, the payment plan is a down sell and I use it as negotiate, negotiating leverage, right? So I tr did you see how when I did the example with him, I traded you the ability to do a two pay yeah. for you making a decision now, mm -hmm. right? So like, a lot of times with objections and like in negotiating, you want to make sure you trade, right? So like, if he would have said no to the two pay, I would I would have figured out why, handled the objections. Maybe I only can get him on a three pay. Yeah. I would have said if you do it now and you give me a case study. I, so you see how I'm like making the trade. I, I that's very key. literally did that last week on a call, and I did a two pay with no interest, thirty days apart. The guy bought, which is great, but. On the website and like the public offer, I have much higher there. So. Oh yeah. yeah well, I, well, that's different. You know, I don't know that as well, but I have heard there's like studies of maybe that increases conversions somehow. I them because that's a different option, right? They're like, oh well, should I pay in full or should I break it up? Because it there's a cost to break. You know, so yeah. I, I you want to not create a bunch of decisions. Yeah, it's it's leverage because if they go online, they can see it's way more. But if we do it now, I won't sure. charge that. Yeah, I'll I think, that's, I think so it's fine. But it's yeah. a pain to, you know, you're doing it offline versus yeah. just taking it online. Yeah, you want to make them also feel like it's very regular. 
for for you to do a payment plan? Well, most people do it up front, you know. This is more of a testimonial. You call. I don't know if you remember. You made a video for your free Facebook group. It was the first time I ever saw you. It was a long, long time ago. You were standing at a car wash, and you were like, "Hey guys, just hopping in here." It to was that you. framework. Yeah, just hopping in here to give you some value. And I was like, "Man, who's this guy? I like the way he talks." This is so long ago, and yeah. it was a financial objection handle. And I took that from that video, put it in our script when I was the only sales guy, and I rocked that shit for like a year. And it closed every almost every time. Like it was bulletproof. Yeah, that's and our whole team uses it. I was just showing them our scripting that we built out, and it's like. As you were saying it, I was pointing down the script. It's 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 gold. It's really good. Yeah, dude, that's that's, that's like one of my like uh, most like out of all my contributions to the industry, I'm like I'm like really proud of that one. Yeah, that's because especially like you might be like, oh, that's not. It, it really works really well, and like you just it, it the way you tie them down and then like you the way you do it, it 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 I used to just that was my way to close everybody, and then if I would get to that point, I would. I would do it on the you know the things of like oh you know because if you keep the payment terms to yourself it allows you because most people what you don't want on the sales call is the good old well i think i have all the information i need is this the best number to get back to you right that's when you lost leadership right so you still got to withhold a little bit of information to still keep leadership in the call you know and that's really what that does just a jordan Belfort says keep your powder dry right you don't want to go and just like shoot off all your oh. your your uh your um bullets out of your gun right you want to keep some of the powder dry so you have some like last you yeah. know last man standing type you know i think, I think Belfort was talking about nice. powder. Yeah, well um, hey. <laughs> okay so we talked about that <laughs> so we actually covered this one we covered this one uh with setter funnels the the main ones i see is literally the group is the easiest to start by far and then after that you have the vsl is the next easiest. And I think after that, if you can fully liquidate on ads, doing some sort of product is the next easiest. But that's like, I think you can get the call funnel to, um, I mean, we got two, uh, two different offers to a million a month just with the call funnel and the setters. So, but I think what you have your setter team, like mine, to where it's almost like pointless to even have the uh, VSL booking calls, that's when you maybe move to a, a, uh, a, uh, like a product. Paul, could you share maybe a little bit about your B2B offer, the deliverables you give for them? Because you said it's like done for you, right? Right, so I mean, we do the recruiting, we place two people, and then, I mean, basically it breaks down into four things, sales systems, the recruiting pipeline, uh, ramp, and, and management, right? So we just, we just help with everything related to a sales team, right? It's like first having the right foundations, then it's like, we, we, we actually teach them the way we recruit if they want to learn that, or we'll just recruit for them. And then with the ramp, like they get access to all of my sales training, they can put all their sales team through, or, uh, and we also teach them how to install their own ramping process within their sales team. And then management, we teach the big three and a few other things in terms of like sales manager scorecards and responsibilities and all that stuff. The one that I bought, STA, that's still, the same, still the same one you sell? Yeah, I mean, dude, since, since you've been in, it's, it's wildly different, you know? Like it's, yeah. I mean, that was years ago. So I would like to think it's, I think you bought like 1.0. There's like 3.0 now. So you have other training portals. Oh yeah. Oh, okay. Yeah, and so yeah, I definitely think it's involved and our supports better. I would hope. Um, in terms of when to move a setter to a closer, ideally when you get a really good setter, you don't want them to move to a closer because it's very hard to replace your really good setter. All right. So a couple tactics is number one, just make them your setter manager. Or your setter lead, right? Number two is make um, If you have to move them up, or you're like, man, I'm going to lose this person, then what I would do is make it contingent on them training their clone, and they will dance to train that clone because they're like they want to be a closer more than anything because they're like they have a chip on their shoulder, they think they're better than the closers, they're pissed that their closers are like, you know, not closing their calls. So you're gonna say, dude, I'm totally fine with you being a closer, but you're so valuable, you need to train your clone before you're able to do it. And your clone needs to hit these metrics. And they will train that person fast. Because there's nothing more they want in the world than that, you know? So you make a contingent on the clone. That's a strategy I actually forgot about, and I'm gonna make sure we're still doing that. Um, 
What else you guys got? What is this sales integrator? Well, I mean, it's really the sales manager, but the, the reason I called it that is like, somebody was asking, like, how do I start, like, can I hire somebody to build the sales team without me having to be on the phone at first? Mm. And the answer is yes. I've done that with some clients, but it is very tough to get somebody who's really good, who's good enough to do that and has the autonomy. Because like, you're, you're essentially hiring somebody who like, is, you know, you're, you're not gonna be involved, right? So like, they have to know everything, kind of, you know? So like, it's almost like if you're gonna do that, I would never recommend doing that if you're big ticket sales. But if you have like, like, uh, like Brian Serhant's a good example. He has a bunch of different businesses. He has a huge content audience. He's like famous. And high ticket is only a small part of his business. Yes, somebody like that should try to find the one person who can build out the department. And the way you attract that person is through a huge opportunity and a big vision and a big cool brand to work for and money, right? So you give them a good profit split of the thing, which should be fine because it's kind of new opportunity for you. So like when I consulted uh, Dean and Tony's team, they were, they were doing these big launches. And so like they would, you've, you've probably seen them, right? Like it's once a year, they do this crazy like challenge to get millions of people in. But well, they were like super burned out of doing that. They were like, dude, we, we hate this. It's like the worst model ever. We make a lot of money, but like, it's just depressing. Like we just hate doing it. And so they were like, we want to build an evergreen team, but obviously Dean's not going to get on there and start selling, right? And so I helped them. It was very easy because it was Tony Robbins and they, had a, they, they, and they could pay a lot. So it was a really exciting for people. And for a lot of sales guys, it was like, they were like, oh dude, that's the thing I want to put on my resume. So I was able to go out there and find somebody for them that used my playbook to build their team to about five million a year is where they're at now, but they're trying to get to 10, 20 million, just evergreen. They're doing, they're doing huge numbers with their challenge, but their evergreen's doing about 400 grand a month. So I was able to find that person, and then what we did with that person is he did two to three weeks of calls. Same thing as I'd tell founder. He did two to three weeks of calls. Once he had it down, and he basically had like the script down and he, he knew what he was selling, how he was selling it, all of that stuff. Then he just hired uh, two salespeople, got off the phones, trained them. Then he hired two more, trained them. Then once he had four, he hired four setters. But he was very good. Like he was, it was hard to find this guy. This guy was uh, one of my one-on-one -on -one sales coaching clients. And he used to work for Tanner Chittister. And he was really, really, really good. He was like my best student of all time, probably. So he, he, he was a savage. I was like, this guy's amazing. And he had just started his own sales coaching offer and I needed this person for Tony Robbins. So I was like, dude, you could do that or you could just like put this on your resume and probably make even more money and, and just crush it. And like, it's, it's a really cool story for you. And I was able to get him to do that. But I'll tell you what, we went through two sales managers before we found somebody to do it. Like it's hard to find somebody who truly knows it because unlike software where it's an older industry, our industry is pretty new and big sales teams in our industry are pretty rare. So to find somebody with a specialized knowledge that's already have done it before is very tough. So that's why I typically recommend if you can, getting to that three to four sales reps and then internally grooming somebody up because it's, it's tough. Unless you have that big brand or a big opportunity, it's tough to find like the truly experienced killer. And it was even tough for me and I, you know, I had to kind of go through and think like, who are the one-on-one -on -one clients I had back in my one-on-one -on -one sales coaching days who were just unreal. And I had to convince, I went through three of them, but the third one is, was that guy. How much time do you have to spend, spend with that guy? Like, was he Dude, we just, just did We go? just did one call just a week and then eventually did one call every other week, but I just basically mapped it out for him. And it, it was one of those things where we, we had such synergy to where I was like, you know what to do? He was like, yeah, I know what to do. I was like, all right, hit me up. <laughs> right. Yeah, it was like, yeah. he just got it, yeah. you know? I knew once we hired him, I was like, this is the guy. Because, yeah. you know, I had spent seven months coaching this person. And I was like, dude, it was one of those ones, I knew he was the right guy, because I was having like, I was like, I kind of want to hire this guy, like, you know, but I, I had to get them somebody. How long did it take him that to get there, to the goal? Um, to what, to get to what, 500K a month? Yeah. Um, I mean, probably three or four, four or five months. But with that company, they have unlimited leads. Yeah. Like they'll, they'll send this, this small of a segment 
and it's like bam like the, the, the foreclosures calendar is just like insane mm. and also it's like people are like sobbing because they love tony so much it's a very different ecosystem than what yeah. we have to deal with yeah they have it easy in that way but you know they, they have a huge list because they've been doing it so long Oh, so you mean like as the setter to closer? Yeah. Yeah, so like if, if, if you have a B2B model and it's a little bit more involved, like it's a higher end B2B thing, that can be something you do. In general though, I have always seen that produce worse results. And that's just out of my observation because you get hit with the, the no-show rate twice. And a lot of times the setters just aren't as impressive as the closer. Well, you gotta think from the prospect's perspective. They watch this video they're ready to hear about the offer. But then you give them to a setter who qualifies them and then like desire fatigues, right? So then like they got to book another call at the closer. They're kind of frustrated because they wanted to hear about it and you didn't tell them about it because the setter can't tell them. And then they, you know, they book them on another, you see what I mean? Like they get frustrated, the show rate. And then if the setters aren't like, if they're kind of young and not that, that helpful yet or they're training, it's also a bad first impression, you know? So they're like, oh, this company's kind of weird, I'm out. You know, so I've always found that to produce worse results. And to be honest, I think when you do have a two call process, generally it works better when the closer does both. But there is definitely companies who do a 1560 model, like if it's more software, or like a enterprise thing, B2B2B, B2B, B2B, and, and, and that, you know, they do do that and it works. Generally though, I would try to just one call close right from the, the application is the setter, right? And then you one call close and you have the, the setters only call the opt-ins. The only thing, so we do have an application grading system, and we grade applications one through four, or we score them, and a two, a one is a DQ, a two goes to a setter because it's borderline. So we do do that, that's it though. And, and that's even arguably like, is this the best use of the setter's time? Because sometimes they just get better leads calling people. Like the best leads are the people who don't book because they didn't have time to watch it or whatever, but you give them a call. Who else? So you're saying in the group model, you've got setters reaching out to people who check yes, send the info on the offer on the survey, right? Yes. What happens if you've already got a big group? Are you reaching out to people that are? Yeah, what I would do is some sort of hand raiser. You've probably seen the comment below if you want the, the blank, right? The easiest thing to do is make that like big purple meme post thing. And it's like, just like, like what I could do, like let's say I had this recording, right? I could say, just presented, you know, uh, just dropped all the details of our $30 million a year setter system at a private mastermind space. Want the recording? And then hashtag like term below. Hashtag, hashtag recording below, right? And I would get like a thousand comments or something like that, right? And then the setters just, that's a good way to get that. Um, yeah. I would say that's probably the best way to, to yeah, like to make them say, yes, I want. some hand raiser. Okay. Yeah, and then you should just do some indirect and direct posts in the group too. So I always do like a case study story and then like DM me if you want the deets or a direct post. And then they just DM you and then you just say, uh, awesome man, happy to help. What's your next week like? Can drop my calendar link if that's easier. So they think they're booking with you and you just put the closers calendar in there. Yeah. I found that you really don't need a setter in your own DMs for Facebook wise. Instagram, uh, obviously, yeah, you do. Or then upselling to a mastermind. You said it doesn't really work because you know they're already tapped out probably. Um, I, I'm just saying it didn't work for me. I, I like, I really wish it would have worked. Or not even bother that, just sell a shit ton of front end offer. And because I'm trying to make that decision, right? I'm going for the same thing. After the selling the front end, the back end, a lot of times you're dealing with people who can't afford yeah. it. Yeah. I would try to do the there. back end. I would really give it a shot. Because, like, I, with our B2B, our mastermind is like similar to how Sam talks about. It's just like a cash cow, pure profit. Yeah. You know? It's amazing. And it's also like the most fun thing we do. You know, it's like what I, it's my best clients. I enjoy it the most. Like, I love it, you know? So I would try to do it. But if you can't, then what I would do is I would just try to like, 
you know, make your, like, that's why we shifted to 9,800. I was like, okay, I'll charge more on the front end, make the terms better, and then we'll add a renewal and we'll do events on the front end. Events. Yeah, we're gonna do we're gonna do virtual, see how it goes, and then maybe experiment with doing live. But I feel like you can't tell somebody it's live and then do virtual, but you can do virtual and then go live. You know yeah. what I'm saying? Yeah. Is your mastermind front end or back? End? Is it sorry on the client side, side or the candidate side? Say again. Is your mastermind for the for the sales candidates or for the clients? Which side? I, it's it's for the, the businesses. The businesses, yeah. Yeah. yeah what? Yeah. Why would they get it? What, what do they get in that mastermind that they don't get on the front end? Three events a year, they get more access to me, they get uh, like more salespeople if they need more salespeople, and then also we allow them to book uh, calls with anybody in my company. Because like you get to a point where like, you know, you guys were asking about like the controller, like some of this stuff like commissions, we have a whole robust tracking system for commissions, and uh, I don't even know how it works. And so like people can book with my CFO, they can book with my my, my two like kind of GMs, uh, like we built out a whole internal recruiting department. And so they can book with that person. It's just like, it's a, uh, they get access to like everything, you know? And then we have a monthly virtual two hour gathering, which people love that. So we'll have a speaker, like we're having like Layla Hormozzi the next time. So we'll have a speaker, we'll have like all, and I just recap once a month what uh, worked for me last month. So like, th this is how I got this. You guys might find this interesting. I. Uh, I had heard Ryan, you guys heard that Ryan Steumann guy? Yeah. I had heard his churn on his mastermind was like insanely low. I forget the stat, but it was like, it was really weirdly low. And so I was asking somebody like, how is it so low? And he said he asked Ryan. And Ryan, what Ryan said is like, well, dude, do you do events? And the guy was like, yeah. And he was like, dude, so how excited are your clients after the events? Like how much value do they think they got? And he was like, oh dude, they're like super excited. He's like, how likely are they, are they to renew? And he was like, dude, super likely to renew. And he's like, gotcha, how many events do you have a year? And the guy was like, three. And he's like, yeah, the only difference between you and us is we do our events monthly. And so like, I heard that and I was literally like, we're doing monthly. And so we do three live and then a monthly mini gathering that has like, it, it's, I review everything that worked for me last month and what didn't work for me and my numbers and all that stuff. Then we do breakout rooms. And then after that, we have a speaker. So it's like quick little two hours, two and a half hours, very easy. Yeah, and then I do a weekly call. Oh, you do a weekly call as well? Yeah. What? Yep. How long? Hour. Yeah. I would recommend though, people love that little virtual event thing. How long's that? Two hours, two and a half Nine. hours tops. Yeah, I mean, I, I just share, hey, this is what worked for me last month, super informal, answer some questions, and then we do breakout rooms. So like they break out and then they share what, what's working for them and we do that by revenue. So it's like, here's your revenue, breakout rooms, we kind of pick for them. And then they come back and then like somebody speaks. Yeah, who said that? Oh. Um, one thing too, this might help you guys a lot. I mentioned an internal recruiting department. When you guys get to four to 500 grand a month, I would highly, and especially if you're hiring a lot of people, I would highly recommend training one person that does all of your recruiting, does your outbound recruiting, manages your inbound recruiting, all of that stuff. And, and I'll tell you this, what really helped us was doing group interviews. So we basically get all, we funnel everybody to application. This is not for our sales recruiting, this is for our, us, right? We funnel everybody to application, then we'll get like maybe like a video or send them some homework or some basic stuff. And then once we wanna like talk to them, we book them on a group interview and we'll have like X amount of group interviews a week per position. So like we were hiring a coach recently. So we were doing two group interviews a week of 10 people for the CSM position. And then so essentially, if you think about it this way, if you do two a week, right, for four weeks and you get 10 people on each, which is not that hard, you're gonna interview 80 people a month for one position. It's so much better than uh, doing one-on-ones. And then you move the best ones to one-on-ones. And typically out of 10, only two or three are ever good. And the thing is, like the human brain only operates off comparison, right? We only know what light is, if we know what dark is, day of night, all that stuff, right? Evil, good. So when you see everybody in gallery view, you're very easily be able to disseminate, oh, okay, like A players, everybody else, really crap. 
It is the most effective thing we've ever done with recruiting and getting good people. And everybody used to talk about like, oh, you need to build your bench, right? Like you need to build your bench of your team. You know, you gotta have that bench where a sales rep doesn't perform and you know, you gotta put somebody in. I was like, dude, how are you gonna build a bench? Like who's gonna do all these one-on-one -on -one interviews? And they're so painful, right? Like you get on one, it's like three minutes in, you're like, all right, this isn't gonna work, but I kind of feel awkward because I wanna leave and you wanna give the person a time of day, all this stuff. And so this is, allows you to just see everybody and you can see their energy, it makes a huge difference. I, I would really recommend you guys all doing that. And uh, what we do in the beginning is we just ask open-ended questions and we see who goes first. Whoever takes initiative is usually the best person a lot of the times. And then also what happens is you ask one question and then everybody will mirror that person. So you want to see who mirrors versus who stands out, right? And then at the end, you say, hey, this is a really fun question, guys. I want you to have fun with this. But like, if it's not you, who would you hire on this interview if you were me? <laughs> and then they pick the best person. And, and a lot of people say, oh, well, that, that'll work for salespeople, but that doesn't work for this type of person. And we do it for every department, and it works. I've even heard, we learned this from Cameron Harold, and he did it for COOs. And it worked for COOs, executives. And we get people writing in, and they compliment us all the time on our recruiting process. So I mean, like, I, I, I feel like it is working pretty well. But it allows us to get volume of people. Like, if you interviewed 80 people for a position, do you feel like you find the right person in a month? Makes a big difference. And then you still move in the one-on-ones, and you do your whole thing, you know? But it makes the one-on-ones more enjoyable. My, how big's my team? It's like 70 to 80-ish. this stuff and then they get them on a call and then they sell them 20k yeah I, I looked at the system though he walked me all through it is very complicated because it's like a, they automated it and it's like you know it's also with Facebook it just seemed like horrid I was like I don't want to do this Other, the upsell maximize. How long? How long is that off? Uh, Twelve months. Twelve months. Yeah. You, what's your uh, What's your retention on that? I mean, how the you mastermind? Just, yeah. You know, I don't know. Um, yeah, I don't know. But people, we really we, we we launched it last year, so I don't even know if we've come up on a year yet. <coughs> yeah. But the front and the back end conversion is like 30 to 40%. Yeah, it's good. really good. Yeah, it's really good. Yeah, if you guys hit... B2B or B2C? B2B, yeah. B2C, you're not hitting that. There's no way. Yeah. If, what, uh, what's the percentage on the B2C? Well, we got rid of the mastermind. What? We got rid of the mastermind. Yeah. Oh, so it's just one, that's it? Yeah. I mean, oh. we're going to do renewal, right? But like, that's after a year. So... You're, do you find that your your ad spend is is you're continuing to grow it, or with your recurring, it kind of balances out? Like, what, what do you mean ad spend? Because you, you spend a lot on ads, right? Because you said and, and you said your formula is you look at projections from your sales guys yeah, yeah, yeah. that rolls all up, and then you base your your ad spend based on that, 
right? I think that's two right. cents, yeah. right? Your ads budget, yeah. and then you start pouring in. Yeah, that but that's way. new client acquisition. That's not counting anything, anything retention or back end. Right, so are you looking always to, to continue to push your ad spend up, or are you, are you looking at that recurring that's coming in based on re retention? Yeah, we, we only base the ad spend off of what we want to hit projections-wise, new units. Right. Yeah. Do you, do you find that you're, you're – that's a real good question. Do you find that you're, you're – because um, I know one of the things Sam, Sam was like, man, like with ads, like you just – like you're always, you're always pumping money out because you got to get – you know, and, and no, the old – not the ads, but like the old model – which was, you know, lifetime, you're always getting new clients. You yeah. always gotta look for new stuff, new stuff, new stuff. But with the recurring model, it's not so bad because now you, well, know, the, you gotta the, wait. Here, here's the main thing. I, here's how I would think about this, yeah. right? And I think I do this, I've done this well, is like, and, and honestly, even though I've done this well, I think ads still suck. However, what, what makes you not have to be on the ads hamster rail with the creatives as much yeah isn't necessarily anything you do with ads. It's actually all the things you do to basically make the energy created from ads as efficient as possible. So like all of those things, like let me go through them all, right? It's basically optimizing two metrics, DPL, dollar per lead, and then also DPC, which is dollar per customer. Also LTV, right, same thing. So how do you make the most out of the ad spend that you have? Setters. Obviously, okay, first of all, your closer is closing really good, right? Second of all, having the highest price point that you can, that you can, that you, that you can sell at. Third, setters. Fourth, email. Fifth, SMS. Sixth, having one really good content channel like Sam's recommending, right? So having a really good YouTube, use to nurture the leads. Having a really good Facebook group, use to nurture the leads. You see what I mean? So those are the six things for DPO. I'm sure there's more, right? Then on... LTV, it's making sure everybody pays their payment plans, right? And getting as high as upsell into the back end and as high as retention. So the reason why I was saying earlier that I ran one ad and one VSL for like eight months untouched is because our sales team was closing really, really well, like all of that stuff, you know? And so it's really about optimizing how much you're getting out of it. And then at a certain point in scale, it always, like right now, it's like I feel like I do got to stoke it a lot more, but we're, we're at such a bigger point. But on the journey up, we were just like one ad, one VSL. So that was nice. So you talked about also how oh, you're considering, because your buddy is uh, using financing, he's doing six million a month, mm -hmm. the financing. So you're actually considering looking at that. I mean, what, what's your, I mean, what ultimately is, is it that you're looking to accomplish? Do you well, want yeah, with that, I mean, the issue with the B2C, the biz op niche, is they don't have money. Right, they're buying so they can get money, which means they don't have it. So what we're doing is like we're doing it for a year, ninety like ninety eight hundred for a year with a renewal, and then there's three virtual events, and then you know that way they can twelve pay it. But when we use financing and they twelve pay through the financing, we get paid all up up front day one, right. and that helps on the ads. So it would help on the, it would help on the cash side. Are you looking also grow like scale as far as? customers with that as well you think that's going to open up more opportunity on yeah that? because we'll be able to be more profitable we'll be able to spend more and hire more people you know all that stuff on the b2c side yeah, yeah. One hour. One hour. cool uh, to manage your ads do well i know you said with setters yeah so there's six things i i mean there, I mean, there might be more than six i just kind of reeled it up. Price point, closing rate, emails, SMS, uh, setters, and then uh, one like really good content like YouTube or like something that you, you could use to nurture the leads. YouTube, Facebook, stuff like that. You run ads on both Facebook and YouTube. I just wanted to know what's the, I guess you'd say distribution between the two platforms, like as far as percentage. We say it again. Like, what's the percentage of ads been on like YouTube versus Facebook? Um, yeah, I mean, our B two C is all YouTube. Our B two B is all Facebook. Are you doing 
No, it's going to be a 12 pay through the financing. Right? YouTube, B2B, Facebook. B2B, Facebook, yeah. But you're, you, you said yours is working well on YouTube. Yeah. Maybe you can show me what you're, you know, what we'll trade. Because I, I, I did some on YouTube, and our cost per lead was quite good, but we didn't really get that good of uh, applications. Like, we, the, it was okay, but it wasn't great. What do you get per lead? We get like 40 bucks. That yeah, was like 30, yeah. Yeah, but our, our uh, appointments weren't that great. But, you know, who knows? Maybe we need to... We were doing keywords. You do keywords, you do custom search. Keywords? Keywords, yeah. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, everybody's targeting that one right now. Yeah. I'm curious, I mean, Sam talks about, like, not doing the things you want to do. Do you feel like you're out of the operations, or do you feel like you're managing people all the time? And just, just day yeah, day day Now I'm relatively out, right? So there, there's, here's how it goes. Like, in the beginning, you're, like, making money, but you're kind of, like, you got the small team, right? And then you, like for me, it was like 300 grand a month to probably like a million a month, where it was like, hate my life, hate my life, hate my life, hate my life, like just grind it, right? Just like, man I was managing every team, so I was like managing the client success team, I was managing the, uh, the sales team and the marketing team, like I was just kind of like this manager, right? I like didn't have a lot of leaders. And then eventually I kind of, like, I got my, like, COO, I got my CFO, I got, you know, one guy to run the B2B, one guy to run the B2C, and all I did was the marketing. And once I got to that point, it was actually much better than even in the early days. So it's kind of like, it's, like, good, and then it's, like, massive suck, and then, like, you kind of escape it, and then it's, like, good again, you know, because, like, you have help, right? That's how I explain it. And it might not be like that for everybody, that's how it was for me. Oh, I mean, yeah, I was managing the sales team till like 1.5 million a month. Yeah, but that's also what I'm, what I'm best at, right? So like, to me, I was like, well, I should just do this. You know, but I, I, it got to the point where I was like, I had such good people where I almost felt like I was like being kind of stupid. I was like, man, like, I, I don't know. I just felt like a, I was like the guy who came on the sales meetings and was like a grouch and was like mean and just like, and I was like, ah, uh, like, because I didn't have the relationship with the reps as much anymore. So I was like, oh, okay, it's time for you guys to do it. And that's, you know, it's a great experience, you know, because then, like, they're just doing it. And you don't have to manage them. Yeah. I also do find, like, it's really hard to be super creative and also, like, a manager, right? It's very different energies, you know? So, like, I think the best thing you do is, like, you validate your offer and your acquisition system. And then once you get like the, the couple ads that work, the VSL or whatever that works, and uh, your offer works, fulfillment scalable, you just like rocket that as hard as you can and max it out, and you go full-time manager. You're just managing, 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 managing until you can build these leaders up. Then you give the responsibility to them slowly. It's like a volume knob, not a light switch. And then you, have, you get your time back to where you can start being creative again. And like you're like, oh man, the product needs work. Product, right? Oh man, like, our marketing, CPA, you know, everything's way higher, right? So you gotta redo the marketing. And then you can kinda, that's my role now. And I enjoy that the most, probably. YouTube B2B or Facebook B2B, any reason why? Well, it's just, it's just what's worked. Right. Yeah, I mean, I've tested everything. So I don't know, like, he, he says B2B works great for him on YouTube. You know, I wish I could, I, I would much rather do YouTube. Facebook, you're always like, Am I gonna wake up without an account? You know? It's like, that's what's scary. Um, yeah. And then we also, for B2C, YouTube just was the most effective. Yeah, we did. It was, it was okay. For B2C or B2B? Yeah, I just feel like it was slightly worse for B2C. <coughs> But we tried it for both. B2B, no. B2C it was slightly worse than YouTube. But, you know, I've heard people doing really well. I mean, we hired Max Finn, and he's, like, the top guy for that, apparently. So, and he was a great guy. Like, I liked Max a lot. Um, and 
we, we followed what he said to do. He like consulted my media buyers. And um, we just found the sherry was higher, the quality was less. Mm. And, uh, and it was just very, we, we kept getting shut down. And we kept getting banned. But I will tell you, the first seven days we were on there, we were getting $10 calls. Yeah, and we never saw that again. I don't know what happened. It was some sort of weird thing. How many media buyers do you have? One. Oh, really? You managed yeah, there's one guy who runs everything. Nice. Yeah. So he's a stud. That's cool. And then I just kind of like tell him what to do. What point should you get the media buyer? Uh, soon. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I mean, I. so for me, I was doing it all myself. The nice thing about the group funnel is it's so easy that you can run the media yourself. I mean, you could literally run that with one campaign. One CBO campaign, super broad audiences, and you just let it go. And it's super consistent. You know, but once you start getting a little bit more involved, I just find like if you want to go one or two routes, if you if you know media buying really well, I would hire like a junior media buyer and then like you train them up on how you do it. And then you just like coach them and train them and stuff. If you're like, I don't really know media that well, you just hire an agency. And just make sure you try to hire a good one. Which is hard, right? But like the thing is, if you know media buying, you can kind of know if the agency is good or not. But for me, I get it. So like I've been doing ads for a while. So like I, I just kind of hired a guy internally, taught him what to do. And I still direct him. I'm like, yeah, do this. But I like kind of. I'm like, yeah, like launch three campaigns, CBO, this, this, the placement, da, 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 da. use these creatives, okay, go. Because what, what really sucks is the reporting and the setup. That's what really gets you. So yeah, you can find somebody on Upwork, just make them a good offer and just be like, yo, work for me full time, you know? <clears throat> we sit, say again? Hire a sales rep from another country. So what about hiring sales reps out of country? So let's say I'm from Singapore, and then let's say I hire a sales rep from Malaysia or from Hong Kong, and then they're speaking to Singaporeans, right? So have you observed that like, impact in terms of like closing, just because maybe the origin, the asset, and everything else is different? So what I've found is, so if I understood it, I mean, there's, there's nothing wrong with hiring internationally, as long as you can keep all your reps on one time schedule in the sense of like, the main thing is they all are gonna be able to make your morning meeting. Yeah, or your, whatever time you do your meeting. I mean, you could do your meeting at night. Like, it doesn't really matter. It's just they all are gonna be able to make that meeting. Yeah. The prospects would, have, would they have a different impression? Uh, different what? Like impression of the sales rep calling. Well, uh, I mean, maybe. I don't know. Nice. Cool.